What is up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Limited Resources. This is episode number 700. My name is Marshall. I'm one of your Limited Resources. And joining me on the line all the way from Denver, Colorado, it's Luis Scott Vargas. Luis, you've been cubing up a storm on your stream this week, man. I've been watching all of it. It's been <laughs> literally awesome. Literally and figuratively. Huh? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> both, both, both literally and figuratively. Yeah, it's been fun. Uh, cube remains my favorite format in Magic. And uh, this this particular iteration of the Cube, well, it's got some things that I really like in it. Yeah, you uh, you and BK donning the ponchos for the the storm was <laughs> that was I really enjoyed that. Like I think I enjoyed that way more than like how much it cost for you to get those ponchos. So it was definitely oh, money. It well was spent. a great deal because BK bought the ponchos. So. Oh wow, <laughs> jeez, really? Good. I, I made out like a bandit. Yeah, and also of course you may have heard that other voice on the line. That's right, the original co-host of Limited Resources is back yet again to chat with us. It's Ryan Spain. Ryan, so glad to have you back on for, for episode 700, as it turns out. I, I didn't even realize that yeah. until it was announced. That's pretty cool. I like yeah. it. And, and of course, I couldn't even wait to my introduction to start talking. So classic, <laughs> yeah. uh, classic yeah. Ryan. Hey, have you done podcasts before? Because yeah. uh, that's <laughs> typically not how you're supposed to do it. You know, it, it, I'm a little rough around the edges. You got to let me... Uh, uh, Get my uh, sea legs back under me here. No worries. You'll have plenty of time because we've got you on uh, to talk uh, today about Vintage Cube. And, and that's for a very specific reason. Not are, only are you an avid cuber just in general, but also uh, you work now for the company that runs Magic Online. And you are, in fact, the person who is curating the Vintage Cube itself. That's right. Whenever you see the cube list come out with the changes and stuff, that is now in Ryan's hand. So that's why Ryan's on the show this week. And we're going to be going deep on the vintage cube changes, cube philosophy, and some bigger picture stuff with Ryan as well. Before we get into that, we did want to say thank you to each and every one of our Patreon supporters. That's how this show is still going. It's patreon.com slash limited resources. You get a thank you card and a sticker in the email, uh, in the mail, excuse me, for signing up no matter what level you're at. And we just wanted to say thank you very much to everybody who supports us on there. It really does mean a lot for us uh, to us. Now, Normally, we do our Patreon question of the week uh, at this point, but I put up a, a thread uh, on the Patreon feed. Everybody who's a patron, patron gets access to that feed uh, asking for questions for Ryan. And so we've got some questions that we'll do later in the show uh, specifically about Vintage Cube and, and they're aimed at Ryan as well. So we'll be talking about those. So what I think we should do here, gentlemen, before we get into the deep discussion is we should do a crack a pack, right? We got, we got to do one. Ryan's on the show and we should do a vintage cube crack a pack. And, uh, so let's do that. And, uh, we'll let Ryan kind of, uh, steer the ship as far as the pick goes you know, what, what his approach is. And then, uh, you know, Luis and I will give our, our, uh, input as well. So first card out, don't think I've ever taken it. Porcelain Legionnaire. <laughs> I mean, it, it's a good card if you're playing mono white or mono red. Those are typically the two decks that are among the better decks in the cube as well. But uh, I don't think any of us on this call are, are, are Porcelain Legionnaire gamers. I don't know. Huh? You, Ryan, you're taking the, what hey, are they called? The toilet? I'm toilet playing to toilet? win, but I'm not starting on that. You know, if I think uh, the, the archetype is open and I okay, want to do it, cool. But uh, it's not where we're starting, right? Yeah. It's just not an interesting card either for, you know, like it goes in the deck and it does its job, but it's not like you feel really anything. <laughs> You're just like, right. here it is. It's going to start attacking you. Next is uh, wear and tear. <clears throat> wear and tear, uh, utility, but not something you start with, right? Like this yeah. is, uh, just a great flexible tool. If you happen to be Boros or multicolor control, it's, it's great, but it's uh, playable in mono on either side and out of the board. So it was just a, that's when I added back uh, Boros can be tough to support. Uh, most people who are doing Borosy things are leaning very one way or the other, not mm -hmm. kind of doing a, a down the middle red, white. And uh, so it can be hard to support Boros, but this is a nice uh, option for that. Uh, blood wear, artist. Oh, I was going to say wear and tear speaks also to the uh, strength of the red and white gold cards. <laughs> yeah. there, there just aren't that many good options in that color combination. Yeah. It's like lightning helix. And then you're like, oh, <laughs> there's nothing left. Yep. Uh, blood artist. Th this is a good nod to the sacrifice deck, which does exist. You don't see it that often, but when it pops up, it's kind of like, oh man, you got all the pieces for this and it actually does a lot of work. Yeah, this isn't 
here for a first pick potential. It's here to wheel if you end up in this deck, and it gives a, a way to that for that deck to win. We don't. I don't know if uh, sacrifice will be a major theme going forward, but it has to be on some level a theme in cube. There's just so many powerful cards. Oh yeah, sorry. That's my. That's, uh, that's uh, there might be some noise in the background. I'm, uh, my my wife is upstairs uh, doing some work. Sorry. Oh no worries, uh, no worries. But uh, yeah, the, uh, the, the the so the sacrifice fiend might not be a, a, a heavily supported thing going forward. But if I if we are going to support it at all, it needs ways to close out a game. And uh, and blood artist, uh, you can just look sometimes and realize oh. I'm damned if they do, damned if they don't. You know, there's nothing I can do here. I'm just kind of doomed. Uh, but it is a, it's a, a late pick for that deck. Yeah, th and that's a nice spot to be in where you can get, you know, basically cards that no other deck wants, right? And you know you're going to wheel it or you can get it. Uh, Windswept Heath. Luis, I know you've been uh, taking a lot of fetch lands uh, very early, even pack one, pick one. Yeah, the addition of Triumphs to the, the cube pool has made fetch lands uh, unquestionably better than the original duels. It used to be kind of close. Do you want Scalding Torn or do you want, you know, Steam Vents slash Volcanic Island? Now it's like I would rather take Verdant Catacombs over, over Steam Vents even if I like red and blue because too often uh, – you know, the duels are always two colors. Maybe they unlock a third if you have a different fetch. But the fetch lands are frequently three to five colors without even trying all that hard. Now, what about Windswept Teeth? That's pretty low. This has to be one of the bottom tier. It, it is, but right? it's not. I'm not even that unhappy to take it early. Like Windswept Teeth is still just a fantastic card. Now, I can throw another land at you guys here, though. Urza Saga, card that sees heavy play in the cube. Um Consider just a very powerful card on its own, you know, regardless of anything else. And it has some cool combos too. Love Urza Saga. You would yeah, first pick it, right? Like it's, it's on your, it's a card you would feel fine first picking. I think, I think you can certainly first pick it. It's a card I frequently first pick like pack two or pack three. Cause once you know, you've got a, either like a busted artifact, like a soul ring or a mox or, or a deck with a sufficient total amount of artifacts, that's where it really pops off, but it's so powerful and it is worth speculating on. Yeah. Th this has to be on the short list of powerful lands, right? Right. For the cube. Oh yeah. And we'll, we'll get into kind of tier listing for vintage cube and, and, and how that impacts decisions and whatnot. And mostly you think of vintage cube, a classic vintage cube, the, the, the S tier stuff being the unmovable parts of a vintage cube being the, the alpha power and all that. But uh, it's amazing how with, you know, the, the game still changes and still makes powerful cards and things come up, uh, especially with these sets that don't have to be standard legal and they can just go a little power nuts with them. We're getting some some new cube all stars out of uh, more modern <laughs> sets and, and Urza Saga is certainly one of them. Well, uh, one of the funny things you can do, uh, if you look at the like top 50 or 100 cards from the vintage cube, it's all cards from the first two years of Magic and like the last four years of Magic. Yeah, because <laughs> it, it's all the cards like Black Lotus, Ancestral Recall, you know, Caracas, like cards they would never make today, and then a bunch of cards that cost usually in the like three to four mana range, you know, Fable of the Mirror Breaker, Minsk and Boo, Ragavan on the cheaper side, Solitude. So it, it it kind of shows you where Magic Design kind of had the, the path that's traveled, where all the best cards in the cube do tend to be really early or really late. The middle. The middle doesn't get as much love in terms of the top cards, though. Obviously, there's plenty of cards from there. Speaking yeah, of cards, should... they'd never print again. How about Time Spiral? <laughs> <laughs> I love Time Spiral. Me too. Good old, uh, uh, back when Mark Rosewater was fixing broken cards by making new broken cards. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It won't make you get to six mana. And then, uh, yeah, Th this would be my pick currently. I, You know, m my philosophy generally for the cube is to take – uh, the absolute most peak high power level option that I can. Um, I will shoot for the fences and see if it's there just because you don't have to play all your cards. So I, I tend to really be willing to take on whatever, you know, I'll, I'll take a splinter twin first, you know, I'll, I'll just go for something that's just like, I, I know what this deck is. And if it happens to be there, then I'm good to go and not really fret that I'm giving up, you know, something else and there's a saga or a fetch land or something. Um, steam vents. Relatively safe pick, but I still think Windswept Teeth is better, and I'd certainly rather take a shot on Urza Saga or Time Spiral. Yeah. Uh, what about Shark Typhoon? I I feel like I might overvalue Shark Typhoon. I, I think it was 
better a little while ago and I still haven't really quite <laughs> adjusted. It feels a little I, slow now maybe. I agree with that. I think that the recent additions in the last couple iterations of Cube, like the aforementioned Minsk and Boo Fable type cards, have made it so Shark Typhoon really not the kind of thing that has as much game as it used to. Yeah. Um, Cobra Always going to be playable. It's, it's just, it's so, it's got such easy value it's uh it's easy to play but yeah it's it's function as a enchantment on the battlefield has has dwindled yeah and and i mean i i I still think i agree with you i definitely think it's playable i still play it but the difference is just like i used to think it was good and now it's like sure it'll take a slot you know it's it's my 20th best card or whatever uh kogla the titan ape this thing actually kind of does work um you know this type of card that i typically ignore because ramp targets for the green deck are usually uh, abundant. Um, and this is kind of in that awkward middle ground where it's like, it's only six mana. So like usually the ramp deck can produce seven or eight mana and you want those big payoffs. And then you don't want the ones that cost five or six because they get got get kind of lost in the fray. You can often jump past that mana base. But that being said, whenever this thing's on the battlefield, I'm like, yeah, okay, it did kill something. And like, if it gets to start attacking, like it just feels like it always has targets for the the naturalized thing when it attacks. So I kind of actually like it. I like it, not and not as a first pick. I don't think anybody's here's going to take it first. No. Uh, I will say it was on. You know, I had a long list of cards that I could cut. You know, could change, and and it, you know that was on the list, right? It stayed in, but uh, Kogla does a job, does some things, but has all the drawbacks that you just mentioned that should it just be an eight drop green creature that's even bigger and splashier or Mm -hmm. should it uh, go a little lower and try to be more interactive artifact, you know, naturalized type effects. Um, So it's that classically awkward five, six mana space for green cards. That's like, uh, what, what's the plan? But uh, it's got enough utility going on that, that I uh, rolled with it still. Bitter Blossom, is this a, a sacrifice deck plant or is it just a popular card or what's the? Yeah, I think I th- it's kind of both. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, and that, that's a great example of why I say while I might not be leaning into sacrifice, there has to be ways in the cube to sacrifice creatures for value just inherently because there's so many cards in the cube that are powerful because of the tokens that they spit out Mm -hmm. and uh and bitter blossom is kind of a poster child for that uh i think of bitter blossom as in that uh higher echelon of like if i don't have this in a classic vintage cube i have explaining to do like why did why did you take that iconic uh powerful card out of the cube right yeah so yeah, and that's going to be a question I, I kind of have for you a little later just to, to think about is how, how much does the iconic nature of cards drive, you know, their inclusion or not in, in, in Cube? So yeah, that, it matters, that's definitely something that matters. Not, it's not the only, it's, it, it's, it matters, but it does, it's not huge, right? Like that's the yeah. thing. There's a lot of factors into what belongs in a, in a vin- classic vintage Cube and what doesn't. But uh, yeah, when you get into that classic nature, uh, iconic and uh, matters, it, you know, nostalgia and I, 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 iconic cards have a plus. It's not yeah. the only thing, but it's a plus. Um, Renin six, good card for the cube. Fetch yeah. land, spine back, strip mine is kind of the big, uh, the big combo with it. But, you know, it'll pick off a lot of creatures just on the doing one damage and you know you 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 have a fetch land going you can really kind of churn out some value for for only two mana from a ren and six i like that card yeah gruel can be another tough pair to find just the right perfect cards uh to support with in vintage cube and uh, i'm really happy that ren and six exists because uh of it, it's it's powerful it supports uh some inherent strategies that uh, a classic vintage cube points towards and it's in a tough to support color pair. So it's yeah. great. Um, new guy, Vornklex. Just no, no text after just Vornklex, the five. Yeah. Five. One. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so these are, um, you know, obviously super pushed, powerful new options that, that you have access to. Um, these are kind of shiny new toys, right? These are made, th- these are the easy picks, right? To throw these in the cube and see how they do. Yeah, I don't want to overdo it. I, I think there's a a, a a misconception about the 
vintage cube historically that somehow the curators in the past or that and maybe me now are like trying to promote the new set by including cards from it like they, they put a bunch of bad cards from the new set in the vintage cube they're just trying to pro it's really not nobody I, i've never been mandated that and whether when i was working at wizards and now no, that's never been a mandate i honestly think the curators of this cube like you are magic players who love new magic cards and want to give them a shot. You know, mm -hmm. that's really what really is what it's about. Uh, and um, and you got to take those shots uh, in some. There's some more obvious cards from this set that I didn't include than Vorin Klex uh, that are still on my list to consider for the future. Uh, and Vorin Klex may fall off, you know, but I but but it has some stuff going on again, exploring that. <laughs> Uh, you know, hey, it's not uh, it's not Pelucranos again, right? Like, let's try something else <laughs> and see right, right. Uh, if this if this lands, you know. And at least like some of the key rules wordings I look for when considering stuff for Vintage Cube is like, is it saying basic land or is it saying forest or is it saying any land? You know, those are like three different ways to search, right? And any land is obviously the most powerful search, but. Uh, uh, Forest, as opposed to basic forest, is a nice middle ground where you can get your uh, dual lands and and do some fixing with this if you if you need yeah, add some tri -tri top end splash too. or something. Yeah, tri lands yeah. exactly. Um, we'll see. Yeah, and and that's I I love I, those ones are like you said. You know, you, we see the same like big green dummies over and over. So anything new, even if it's kind of similar, is is good enough. Uh, Liliana of the Veil. I mean. This is a card that like used to be super good and is like not that it's just OK now. Yeah, I think it is just OK now. And this is a great example of that. What, how much does iconic matter? Right. Because this is this is more iconic than great. Yeah, uh, she is certainly good. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is a powerful effect for three mana, but uh, all timer when she arrived and now down the list. Should she be cut from the cube? You know, that's the that's the type of question, right? Uh, yeah. I like this card in the cube for the reanimation deck. You know, yeah, I, it's I, certainly where it's best. Yeah, I mm -hmm. think that's a cool middle ground for it. And then, you know, various iterations of the cube will push or um or not push a mono black deck as well. And you know, it's gonna be a good card in that too. Uh Karn, Scion of Urza. This is the the four mana Karn. Too slow. So it's always like plus one, get a card I don't like. The The times that I have seen it used well, though, is when people just start making uh, constructs. They're just like zero, zero, you know, or minus two, minus two, minus, you know, just as many times as yep. they can. In again, the artifacts deck, they can be making, seven right? sevens. Yeah, tokens. And, and that's actually pretty good. I just don't think that people think of that when they see this card, or at least not yet. They, I, still, I, I still think they think of it as like a value engine, you know, where you can get a bunch of stuff going in it's colorless so it can go in any deck but i found that i would i would play it in like the deck that luis is talking about with urza saga where you're playing a bunch of artifacts where these constructs are actually like seven sevens or whatever but if it was just like i need some card draw i, I wouldn't run card sign of urza i agree uh, it's oft, often our planeswalkers are about the the top abilities and not the bottom one uh but in this case this is in the cube in my mind because of the bottom ability if it was just some uh, colorless card advantage there that I don't think it would be appropriate, yeah. but the uh, artifact tokens is on point. Yeah, Karn, Karn is the kind of card I like there being a good amount of, which is it's not a good early pick, but some decks want it and most decks don't want it. And having a collection of those cards makes you feel good when you are the person who can take it and kind of ignore it without really any pain when, when you're not, yeah, you're just not going to put it in your like mid range green deck, but in your blue deck that has maybe Tularan Academy and Urza Saga and Urza, it's like, oh, Karn, yeah, this, this is good for this deck. But one yeah. out of four times it's good, or one out of eight times, not, you know, every time. Whereas like there's some cards that are clearly good every time. Last card is Duretti Scrap Savant. Mom's spaghetti. <laughs> Speaking of which, <laughs> yeah, yeah Duretti's a. Card I don't think you play very often. It's on the weaker end, but some decks do do want it, and it can. It has the the capability of doing powerful things. Yeah, that ends up. It, it, we'll we'll get into this. In, uh, we talk cube design, but like there's this domino effect when you. Well, you're.
and you want to support that. And then, so you have to have these in, and then you start looking around and going, well, okay, we've already got, we have to have huge artifacts in because we're doing Tinker and we're doing Channel. So we, all right, we should do Goblin Welder and Duretti as well. You know, so these are the, 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 the kind of this cascading impact of like, well, if you have to use this, then what other things cross over so that thing that you feel like you have to use isn't filled with a bunch of parts that are only for it. Yeah, that, man, I could totally see just going down a rabbit hole and then finding yourself in a spot where you're like, oh, I've got a bunch of cards for some random archetype, but they're not really meshing. You know, that 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 could be difficult. What would you guys take here? I, I would take Time Spiral. I, I would also take Time Spiral. I think I'm on Saga. I yeah. think just both, just both just hope, hope are, springs eternal. I'm going to open yeah. something sweet to get, get go get with the saga. Yeah, well, well, <laughs> I, th I think both cards are cards that aren't good in a r random deck, but if you have the right deck, they're 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 great. And uh, a big part of cube is like what what do you want your draft to be like? Every time you can kind of make that decision, which is why, yes, if your goal is to win, if you were playing in the like Magic Online Championship this this weekend, actually, there's a, there's a cube mocks. You know, you, you'll have it dialed in and when those players w are not looking to have an adventure. They're looking to draft the best deck possible. But every single person who's drafting on Magic Online, every draft they get to decide, oh, do, do I feel like I'm t taking Entomb or Birds of Paradise? You know, both those are like just valid first picks and depends kind of what you feel like doing in any particular instance. Yeah, for sure. Okay, Ryan, let's get caught up with you real quick before we get into the nitty gritty on the cube and the cards and stuff. Because, sure. I mean... You were the original co-host for LR. Um, then you eventually had a long run at Wizards of the Coast. Then you did your stream going optimal. Mm -hmm. And now you're the creative director at Daybreak Studios, which is the company that has the publishing and developing rights for Magic Online. So basically it's a company that runs Magic Online now. So you've been, that's quite a journey you've had. Yeah, to, uh, it's been all magic for the last uh since well since we started basically yeah <laughs> like, yeah <laughs> uh, uh in in one way or another um but basically uh wizards decided they didn't want to they wanted to focus on arena and move forward with that as their primary digital product and they had to make, did make decisions about magic online and rather than you know it, it's not that it, it's providing a useful uh, place in the digital ecosystem for magic players. It's still profitable. You know, it, there's, there's no reason to shut it down, but uh, arena, but with arena wizards really wanted to just be focused on one product. So rather than just try to like figure out how to shut it down and, and also take away formats from players that they're, you know, they're used to having, they wanted to find another thing to do and that's uh, sending it, to Daybreak now. Daybreak is is uh, effectively a business that is a, hu a centralized hub of video game services that supports their satellite studios, mm. and their satellite studios generally are all running uh, legacy games, games that are ten to twenty years old, um, and so they're basically experts in providing the services and uh, support needed for. Uh, venerable games to continue going, continue growing, adding uh, new players and uh, supporting their existing players. And it's right there in the name. So instead of sunset, daybreak, right? Ah. Uh, and uh, so we are making uh, daybreak for Magic Online. It was a tough transition. Uh, the moving, in, moving a game out of one company into into another was a unique challenge. Uh, Daybreak is has a lot of experience acquiring a whole studio. You know, here's this turnkey operation that's doing its thing. We're going to get it and put it on our side now. And and at that point, you can start to assimilate it as you want, and it's still functioning. Uh, I likened the Magic Online transition to a hand transplant. It's like you're saying, well, we're not going to hire that whole person. We just need their hand. So instead <laughs> of hiring that whole person, we're just going to hand transplant. And it makes complete sense. You're like, I get it. We're going to take that. You know what I mean by it, right? Yeah. Uh, but then you're like, okay, let's look at the details of how to pull that off in a way that works. It's like, oh, every capillary needs to connect in the new location. And everything about the hand needs to work with the new host, right? It's wow. It's a really 
crazy. It was actually quite challenging. And there's some uh, unheralded heroes of, of of the realm here that uh, that helped us get this uh, this ship to the other port. Okay. Uh, now I know that from big picture Magic Online stuff, you're gonna you're gonna be you're gonna go on a podcast called The Dive Down. Yeah. And talk like about a the few weeks. Uh huh. And talk about what the future of the client and that the, the bigger picture kind of creative director stuff. Yeah, roadmap. Uh, what you know? What is the plan for this product into the near and medium term future? Right. Okay. Uh, so people can look out for that when when you go on there if they're curious about Magic Online stuff in yeah, general. Okay. Totally. But for us, we want to talk about Vintage Cube. Of course. Oh, yeah. And part one of your roles there has been to become the curator of the Vintage Cube. And, you know, this is anybody who follows Vintage Cube knows that inside Wizards of the Coast, when they were running it, there would be one person from R&D who was kind of the person who was tasked with making the changes. And, you know, Vintage Cube tends to go in seasons, right? It comes out for a stretch of time and then it's not available for a while and then it comes back. And usually there will be card changes in between. Well, somebody needs to make those, right? And and that has fallen on your desk. Mm -hmm. And... The first thing I want to know about that is just from a personal, just like, dude, <laughs> right? Like, is it like, I mean, Vintage it's, Cube it's has awesome. like a rabid, you know, I mean, Louis said at the beginning, it's his literal favorite way to play Magic. He's a lifetime Magic player, right? It's mine too. That It kind of feels like that's a lot of pressure, you know, like, don't screw this up. I was say, right. It's, it's awesome, which is to say it is an awesome and fun honor to do this work, but it is an awesome responsibility. This is uh, one of, if not the most important cubes in the world, uh, in the in the magic community. Uh, it's setting the it's tone. It's hands down the most important cube. I don't think yeah. you can argue. More people play this cube than every other cube. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, that has certainly historically been true. I wonder, I don't know what Arena does in terms of numbers on their cubes, uh, mm. it, but certainly historically, it's the most played cube. Oh, in the no, right. We were talking about real real cubes only. <laughs> <laughs> hey, no. I, uh, no, I'm not. Darby is making some well, awesome it, cubes. For if you count all the people who pay, have paper versions of the Magic Online cube, I don't think it becomes close because yeah. I know a lot of people who have paper magic online cubes uh, are ourselves included, you know, with some changes, obviously I don't know anyone who has like the arena cube in paper. Yeah. So, and, you know, I think it, that and, and stands the arena for cube, cube changes and, and, but yes, exactly. I think that's the, the, this is meant to be the flagship representative cube of the concept of classic powered vintage cube, right? Yes. It's, it, 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 and that's what I went in with, with this, I, my philosophy was, I want this to be the uh, platonic ideal of vintage cubes. Just this baseline meets at, hits all the buttons you expect and uh, and is doing some interesting things with the uh, space left over, of which there's not much, which we'll get into. Um, but I also don't want to bury the lead uh, because I'm going to tell you, like, I I made a large number of changes. And part of the philosophy behind that was to, to demonstrate that uh, I'm going to be responsive to feedback. I am listening to the community. I'm listening to especially the content creators that are the ones promoting this this experience and demonstrating it's fun, hopefully. So uh, I, I, I made a lot of changes partly to get a lot of feedback and to show you that we are going to be responsive to the to that feedback. I've already done that once. There was a little bug with Karn and I used that as an excuse to 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 uh, correct what I think is was my biggest mistake uh, of the cube, which was to bring back Layla. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, or Layla, yeah, sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that that was just a mistake. But and I can get into that too, like how, how I got there. Um, but I but before I want to say also I have been listening and taking in feedback. And because we added on a bonus extra week of Vintage Cube that wasn't part of the original schedule, I went to Tony, our product manager, and said, look, this is a bonus week of Vintage Cube anyway. We're trying to show some responsiveness. Let me make some tweaks to the to the final week of the Cube that show that I'm listening to what people are saying. And uh, oh. so uh, starting on Tuesday, when we head into the final week of Vintage Cube, the following seven changes are going to be made Whoa. to the cube. Uh, the following, uh, so we're uh, bringing out 
or I'll, I'll go with the in uh, retrofitter foundry coming back in. Okay. And I'm going to cut uh, sorceress spyglass for that. Um, maybe you'll find a place for that again later, but uh, the key here was getting the fan favorite and and good, you know, actually I shouldn't have cut it just because it actually helps one of the themes that I was trying to support, right? So not only is it a fan favorite, it should it was actually helping some of the things I was trying to do. So we're going to bring that one back. Um, I shouldn't have cut two red five drop dragons. So we're bringing Thundermaw Hellkite back and I'm dropping uh, Ferocidon for now. I still think Ferocidon has has a potential place in Vintage Cube, but it's mm -hmm. not an important card. So uh, I, I let it go and uh, brought back a, a fan favorite and a, a shoring up that hole a little bit in Red 5. Uh, and then um, getting rid of uh, Thought Picker Witch and bringing in Yawgmoth Thran Physician instead. I... I'm not going to say I regret putting in Thought Picker Witch because it caused some uh, smiles and outrage. And, you know, it caused a reaction, right? Mm -hmm, which is, which mm -hmm. is not the worst. And it got people to think about, like, what was he thinking? And I think when, you know, a lot of people don't even know that card. But once you start thinking it through, like, it is actually a pretty dastardly way to win, <laughs> win a Magic <laughs> game that still leaves some hope. But it doesn't belong in the Vintage Cube. I know that. Um, and, what, and, and really uh, not bringing back Yawgmoth when I'm pushing... Sack was just an oversight. So let's fix that, fix that oversight and um, and get rid of the kind of the fun choice that's really a, kind of a blank. Mm -hmm. uh, and then um, I like that I tried out um, Dream Halls and uh, Arena Rector, uh, but I didn't add any more oomph for those two cards. And so to help with that a little bit, I took out uh, Tezzeret the Seeker, the five mana blue Planeswalker, and I put in uh, Nickel Bolas God Pharaoh. So oh, that provides sweet. a three color uh, planeswalker that, you know, seven drop planeswalker that's worth uh, rectoring into play and is castable by Grixis and, uh, and is um, uh, functional in three colors for Dream Halls. Um, Ryan, if you if you cut dream holes, you're dead to me. So just <laughs> yeah, you, you, you should have seen Luis's heart stopped when you said dream holes. Like he's been drafting like he was trying to keep it a secret. Him and BK have just been only drafting dream holes deck all BK's, week. BK's second in the trophy race right now. Yeah. And it's nice. it's off the back of dream holes. But, but it's yeah. good news, Luis. He, there's yeah, more support coming a little for dream better, holes. A little yeah. oh, I, I, I love it. I, I had I had kind of been saying all week that I think that uh, one more big planeswalker would be really nice for arena rector so well, there you go uh it's coming and then uh angel of sanctions uh this is kind of somewhat of a double swap like angel of sanctions I, I wanted to take out karmic guide and i wanted to put in um uh elish norn mother of machines uh but i also i've never loved bane slayer angel and that's like uh it's just yeah not great and i still don't think it's great but it was at least doing a, a real job in the cube and Angel of Sanctions is just kind of like this that is arbitrarily okay card that doesn't have a real purpose. So um, I still don't know what I want to do about the Bane Slayer slot, but for now, I've uh, I'm cutting Angel of Sanctions and bringing in actually Boonbringer Valkyrie, which is you know Bane Slayer. It's like instead of uh, protection from dragons and uh, demons, you get uh, the new mechanic uh, where you can. Uh, make back it the up. five five or you can mm -hmm. give it to yeah back up somebody else so that felt like uh if i'm like okay i i don't know what i'm doing here yet with bane slayer so let's revert to bane slayer but let's do the new one that's kind of kind of plays more interestingly uh and then uh out looter ill core in ledger shredder that's just an undo uh, that's a swap i made that i regretted uh, my mindset when i made it was that uh that i was bringing back the really cool uh ninja and that uh, plus one, plus one counters on a blue evasive creature don't play well with ninjutsu. You don't want to bounce that. But that's a very narrow, limited thing to to, to make that choice over. And, I, I, you know, um, I also do like supporting attacking matters. You know, like you can get into a place where in Vintage Cube where like <laughs> creatures, what are they? Or, you know, and, and yeah. so I do like having combat mechanics and that's it. so it was the nostalgia factor and the combat mechanics and the support of a few archetypes that had me bring back in the classic but it's not as powerful and uh, and also i under uh, uh undervalued the love for ledger shredder there's just a lot of 
community love for that card. So I was like, great, you know, this is, and we'll get into that too. Uh, data does not tell you love, right? Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> data tells you win rate, but it's very hard to understand what people love from uh, from the numbers that you can produce uh, from these cubes. Um, and then uh, finally, uh, this is a you know simple one, but uh, I, I'm taking out Cabal Therapist and replacing it with Cabal Therapy. Mm. Uh, it, it was a it, it was kind of on the edge. I I was. Black is tough in cube. Like, what is it about? What is it good at? I mean, one of its core things is discard, right? Mm -hmm. And so I had this thought that we could we could lean into that a little more for black and had um, therapy and therapist in the mix. And because I was taking out a black creature, I sold myself on, oh, well, replace it with a creature. And then this one, since you're do since there's more sacrifice support, this could allow you to do it again and again and again. But it's just not as good as and as important as a reanimator player being able to uh, self discard the turn they draw that card. It's just mm. like it's kind of uh, it would be so feel so bad to be a reanimator player and desperately just need to get that creature in the graveyard and draw the creature, you know, draw the therapist instead of the therapy. So a uh, minor change there really in the in the scheme of things, but it was bugging me. So uh and those are the ones that I decided to correct. There's other corrections um, that I, you know, we can talk about. I'm sure they'll just come up in our conversation here. But um, it, you don't really want to do this too much. It's not it's not good practice to announce this is what your cube is going to be and then uh, and then suddenly mix it up. But this is a very specific spot in which we have a bonus week. There is a big shakeup. I'm trying to show responsiveness and show listening to feedback. So for this time, we're doing it with these cards. And you might be thinking, but Ryan, what about the land? You shouldn't have taken those uh, uh, creature lands out. And you might have your list of things that you think should have been in that seven. But the point is, I just want to show everybody we are listening. We're going to uh, switch things up just a little bit uh, and correct a couple of the uh, more, what I felt were the mistakes that, uh, were consistently being called out from the uh, the very many many reviews and uh, feedback uh, <laughs> that, that I consumed about my changes. Luis, uh, look, your thoughts? Well, first of all, these these changes are all that these recently announced changes that you just told us are all great. Um, they line up with a lot of the stuff that I was hoping to see. And honestly, like whenever people brought up stuff like Thought Picker, which I was just like, look, this isn't going to be in the next version of the cube. As it turns out, it's not even going to be in this version of the cube very quickly. <laughs> like. I, I don't, you know, like I'll admit, I don't know Ryan super well, right? We haven't spent like a ton of time talking or whatever, but I know a lot from Marshall about, you know, how how you think and and like the sorts of things you value, and you don't seem like someone who's hung up on doubling down on something that uh, that didn't work out and thought Pricker, which kind of clearly didn't work out. It didn't take a lot of time to figure that out, so I wasn't really worried about that, and. It, Overall, I think these changes are great. I love getting Ledger Shredder back. I think Boonbringer Valkyrie is a much cooler take on Baneslayer because there's actually some gameplay to it. It's not just right. cast this and hope it wins. Love the Nicole Bolas. Yogmoth's a fantastic card. And uh, Cabal Therapy is a – it's funny to think of Cabal Therapy in cube because it's, you know, like the, it's all one ofs. But I think it actually is going to play pretty well. And Cabal Therapy is just honestly an embarrassing magic card. It's just uh, <laughs> really not 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 one you want to be putting in front of people. So I, I really like these changes. And uh, certainly I'm, I'm very happy to see more so than the changes, the responsiveness, because this is, I think, what we're all hoping. Um, I, I don't think people ever thought whoever was in control of the cube didn't like cube. It always came through that. And you showing this amount of responsiveness makes it really clear to see that like not only are you listening to the folks who are playing a lot and you know are passionate about this but you're also making good decisions as a result of that so uh, i think it's a great sign of things to come yeah cool. you know I, yeah i want to i want to focus on the the thought picker which thing just cuz it to me um there's two things that come to mind when we when we talk about not the card itself but the idea of putting the card in the cube right and one of them is what you've both referenced here, which, and Ryan, you said, it's not actually the worst that people are talking about it. And I thought that too. I mean, any one card in the cube, who cares? Like there's, you know, a ton of cards in there. And if it never sees play, it never sees play. It, it was fun to meme about it, right? It yeah, was fun exactly. <laughs> to, to talk about it. And, and, you know, I don't know, th there's something 
that, you know, magic has always been so much more than just playing the cards on the table, right? The thing that makes it a lifestyle game or a hobby that you can get this into is that we can talk about it this whole time when we're not even playing, right? And to me, things like Thought Picker, which are fun, they're funny. And in fact, I saw a discussion, I think it was on your stream, Luis, where it was like, we should figure out what the, you know how like we have a mythic uncommon for every set? Like what's the, what's the one card in the cube where you're just like, what the hell's going on here? Like this card's lost or, right. you know, it was this a misclick or, you know, and it's fun to talk about that. Like, you know, as a community member, right. And it, it just, it generates discussion. And then also, you know, it sets a funny bar. Like what if somebody <laughs> beats you with hot picker, witch? like if they're doing the thing where they're like bitter blossom and you know, whatever, and, and they're manipulating you your, at him and then suddenly you never draw another relevant card for the right. rest. Right. And you're like, God, oh, you know, it, <laughs> and what's the first thing you're doing? You're, you're texting your friend going, dude, I just got beat by Thought Picker Witch, right? Have to retire. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. It's, it's have to, you know, so that part I, I think actually does have like a lot of fun. And, but I did want to parlay that into more of a philosophical side of things for, for you, Ryan, because, you know, yeah. I, I went over the changes when they came out and I, Th to me, they had your fingerprints all over them because they, to me, you hit a really nice balance with the changes, which is to me, I would kind of break it down into like maybe three broad strokes categories. One of them are cards that either have already proven to be good and popular or seem like they would be. So maybe a new card that's just like, that's going in the cube. That's going to be great. That type of thing. Right. And, or a popular card that just hadn't been in the cube for a while. It comes back in. Okay. That's great you know, those are going to be check marked as this is a cube playable card and people like it, or this is a totally reasonable shot to take, you know, on a, on a new card. Then there's like the thought picker, which type, right? Which is to me, the type of card that is you're taking a shot, right? You don't know if it's going to work. In fact, if I would have messaged you and said, Ryan, what do you think thought picker, which is going to become like an important card in the cube? You probably would have said, no, probably not. But like, I Let's try something I, out, right? I Let's, would even say in the case of Thought Picker, which it goes farther, I put it in knowing it was only going to be there one time. Mm -hmm. there, there, there was no way this was actually going to be good enough to be like, oh, this is now a mainstay of the Vintage Cube. Right. It was the uh, Vintage Cube curation is like a restaurant pantry uh, you're, you're, you're gathering. I, I was initially thinking it was like, it's like a, a cooking show, right? But then I was like, no, it's more like, the prep for the cooking show <laughs> that other people are going to do. And I've got to define yeah. this, uh, this pantry of, of ingredients that people are going to use for their cooking <laughs> show. And uh, there are some ingredients where you're like, uh, this is, this is not flour. This is not sugar. This is a, a really super weird exotic spice mm -hmm. that we're going to toss in for this one episode and people will look at the weirdness and it'll be part of that episode's, story and then it goes away right like that's and maybe thought picker which is too low power to be to be doing that your, your feedback could be okay ryan but like up the you know up the power level a little bit sure that, that's fine and that's fair but that is ultimately the philosophy of that type of slot and especially and also my philosophy of going through this whole thing is like anybody you know for the stuff that you are critical of and anybody listening like if you if you have strong you shouldn't have done that feels i like First, go through all the things I cut and count the number of cards you don't care about on that list. <laughs> like, count, count the number of cards I took out that you did not care about, and then give me that number of strikes before you say that I <laughs> that, yeah. I, that I have really messed up. Because I, I grant you that some of the things uh, w w that went back in were maybe on the dud side, but I took out probably more duds than I put in. I, that's yeah. what I Thing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and I, cause that's the thing is that like, okay, we, we have fun talking about thought picker, witch or whatever, but some of the cards that haven't either haven't been in the cube in a while or haven't before, like the two that you mentioned, like dream halls and the rector, you know, like so far dream halls has been kind of a game changer. Like th that card is like, especially with like cards like Atraxa and, you know, you were talking about putting nickel bolus and stuff you know, th those are nasty combos, right? And draw sevens with dream halls is stupid, you yep. know, and, and people have been not taking it. I suspect that it will be much higher on people's list. Like say the next iteration of the cube, assuming it's still in it where people have gotten used to it and kind of seen what some of the dumb stuff that you can do with it. Right. Because 
all of these that we take for granted, like I believe that Dream Halls will become one of those cards. The Rector, I don't know, maybe. Like I've seen a little bit of of nonsense. Less with of a it. chance, but not zero. Right. But you know, remember when they put Underworld Breach in the cube, and it's like, I, if you would ask me, is this going to be you an can't awesome? Imagine cube the card? cube without Underworld Breach. But, right. But when you put it in, I would have been like, I don't know. Like maybe it'll yeah. be good. Maybe it won't. And it's like, then you guys found Brain Freeze and and LED with it, and it's like, oh, now it's just uh, like. An absolute, like, I'd be furious if under if Underworld Breach was out of the cube, right? It is an absolutely cornerstone, cool, interesting, difficult card to figure out and play. But you have to take those shots, right? If you just looked at it and said, eh, it's kind of weird and it's a little hard to set up, we're just not going to run Underworld Breach, the cube would just be worse, like notably worse, right, than, than if it had it in there. And to me, when I see those type of cards that make my eyebrow raise, I'm thinking, oh, Ryan's taking a shot. You know, he's going to see what what's what with this card. But as you pointed out, Luis, Ryan's not the type of person to get married to any card idea, anything like that, where he's just like, nope, this is how we do it. And you're going to live with it. Like that will never, that will never be the case. Uh, that's just not how Ryan's brain works. So yeah. So, I mean, I think it's awesome. Like I, you know, I don't view any one card slot in the cube as being particularly precious. You know, the thing that hurts is when they take away the card that you really love, right? If it's like, I build around this, I feel like I figured this thing out and then it comes out, that's when it's like a bummer, right? That's the one that you're like, no, my, my pet card is no longer in the cube, you know? And I don't just mean pet, you know, like for example, Man of War is my favorite card. It did used to be in the cube and now it's not, but when they took it out, I was like, yeah, I mean, it, it wasn't Time, really up to the power. that one by, I'm afraid. <laughs> right. It just wasn't really there. You could do a few fun things with it, but it just, you know, it made sense to me, even though I was obviously a little bummed just because it happens to be my favorite. But when we're talking about the really interesting build around stuff, that's the one that really stands out, you know, like, you know, right. like, like uh, Underworld Breach and stuff like that. Yep. Yeah. The, let's see, maybe this is a time to, to transition into talking about, you know, the, the philosophy of like how a vintage cube and a classic vintage cube, one that you're uh, purporting to be the, the kind of the baseline for, mm -hmm. for the, for the idea of vintage cube. Well, some things are forced immediately, right? So let's, let's just follow the thread of what gets forced when building a vintage, uh, uh, let's call it the a classic powered vintage cube. Uh -huh. right? So powered right there in the yeah. name, bam, there are nine cards that are now expected of you. And once you start with the power, you're starting with the most powerful cards in the game. For that to be any kind of ongoing regular fun, everything, you need to meet that power level or else it just becomes about mm -hmm. uh, uh, those powerful cards. So you, those are the most powerful cards, arguably. Uh, but of course, that means you got to look around and start bringing in the nearby stuff that is in the same vein. So your, your mana vaults and your, your other, uh, artifact mana, the, the coin flip, uh, moxen basically, you know, there's just so many busted cards in that realm. Uh, soul rings, not even technically power nine, but of course that becomes obvious in, in, um, all right, so now we've got these, uh, the fast mana busted stuff and the hyper-efficient blue cards and the extra turns. Um, but you're, you've got to draw seven. So now there's, it, it's implied that like it, you're, you're, you're married to this draw seven. It's one of the power nine. There's other draw sevens of the game. You start, okay, well, we got to support draw seven as an archetype. Um, you start to say, what, well, what power level matches these, uh, the, the power nine, well, there's all these old school cards that do these crazy things uh, in a way that they never printed again because they were too broken. Uh, and so you get these one off. It's the channels. It's the uh, uh, the even Oath of Druids, which I'll name not because it's like tearing up vintage cube, but because it's that class of card. It does something very powerful that they never quite did exactly the same way again. Um, and you start so then you get into well reanimation like reanimation is where a ton of you, you can't i don't think you can do classic vintage cube without uh reanimation and then you get in so now what are we looking at we're looking at uh ramping we're looking at artifacts we're looking at reanimation now we're talking about big gigantic creatures and what what to do with them and then you've got your your show and tells and um sneak uh, sneak attacks and uh all sorts of other you know green ramp and so you become kind of married to ramp strategies, right? It's hard, mm -hmm. like, 
because what Vintage Cube is doing so well is is a uh, busted mana production, you got, you have to lean into that. And another uh, unique broken card like Upheaval, right? Like uh, to me, that's a uh, practically a mainstay. Like I can't. Like if I cut Upheaval, like what are you doing? Like that's that's. It's n nothing else does that. They won't do that anymore. All you know, all permanents return to hand like that, and uh, you you just more as you start to do this exercise, you realize the cube just fills up <laughs> pretty quickly <laughs> yeah. with almost must include cards and must support archetypes, and it it becomes one of the challenges is understanding that uh, you're. Goal is to make a fun thing to play. I think I put this in my article or, or in one of my comments. The goal here is not a magic card museum. It's a fun play experience. And so if we were doing a magic card museum, uh, Necro would be in the cube. Um, but uh, Necropotence is, is too hard to support in this format. So even though it qualifies as iconic, busted, uh, truly one of the most uh, impactful cards ever printed to the game in terms of the competitive scene but it finally had to leave the queue because nobody was playing it and it was too hard to make work yeah. right so uh so that's another thing that that happens uh in terms of like if power is the if you're if you're starting with power and going out from there when when is power not enough right that's that's a huge question about vintage cube curation and one of the places that's not enough is that it's too narrow too hard to support like necro um or too narrow to support i here's a here's a hot take like uh kiki jiki strategies they, they they seem integral to a classic vintage cube but they're frustrating because i have to include pestermite or what you know like there, there's these like i i'm in my head i'm like how do i get pestermite to be a more useful card uh, outside so of that, just being a combo of, piece. I, I've got an answer that you won't it's, like. I know it's time vault. <laughs> yep. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but, so great. Let's, let's go there too. So un, that's the next stage <laughs> where, uh, powerful, uh, powerful, but not in the cube. Why not fun, right? Or, uh, it, it either warps the cube design, which time vault does to an extent, um, or it warps, uh, uh, it, the play, so it sets that it's not fun. And that's the that's been the trickiest part for me to assess and the part that the data doesn't help with. Um, the data is going to show me that uh, White Plume Adventurer is a very successful magic card uh, for winning games. Should it stay in the cube? No. Do you, you want to do you want to hear my rant about White Plume Adventure now? Is this a good sure. time? Yeah, go for it. I, I, I believe White Plume Adventure uh is the only big mistake you made with the cube changes because I agree with a lot of what Marshall said earlier. I share the same philosophy of you add a thought picker witch or you add a dream halls or a helm of awakening or a, an arena reactor and they don't work. And basically no harm is done. Well, I think dream halls and helm work, but set that aside. You add a card that doesn't work. I don't think, I think there's minimal damage done because it doesn't really matter these cards, if they don't get played, they don't get picked. Aurelia, the war leader, was in the cube for like three years, and like no one ever cast her, and it didn't matter. It gives a little feel bad during the draft, but once the draft right. is over, it might as well not have. It's not exactly. A it's yeah. not a big deal. White Plume Adventure and Initiative, in specifically, I think, are a huge barrier to entry for people who haven't played Magic recently. Uh, I think it's unbelievably powerful. I actually have it like eleventh on my list of like what are the top. 25 cards like i'm writing an article and i think it's better than everything that isn't power basically wow uh it, you just cast the card and you basically always win and it, it you like opens up this dungeon there's all these possibilities that you have that you're at as the opponent you're forced to learn like it's not just did i opt into playing putting this card in my deck it's like oh now i'm presented with this we don't have that, and we're never going to add any initiative cards to our paper cube. We have a lot of Magic players who you would not be surprised to learn. Maybe you haven't played in the last couple of years. <laughs> I don't want them picking up White Plume Adventure and looking at it in their pack and being like, I don't know what this does, and I don't want to learn it. I think it has a pretty negative effect. And uh, I guess if, if I could ask one thing of you for changes, it would be to, to not put initiative cards. And I, I think that it's 
kind of magic at its worst in in in, in a bunch of different ways. So that that's my rant on a white plume adventure. <laughs> I love it. I mean, I love that I got one. Right. I mean, uh, th- this is why I made so much change. I, in a sense, I wish I could have done more. Like the because the the discourse has been all around the cards that I added or cut. We're not even have very little has been said, not nothing, but very little has been said about the stuff I should have cut but didn't, or the stuff I should have added but didn't. Right? There's a whole other layer of of right. uh, of discussion <laughs> around this, but to understand what the community thinks about this particular question of when do when does a mechanic or card deserve to not make it deserve to be cut from the cube despite earning its spot on power level. And because we hadn't done uh, White Plume Adventure, I wanted to include it and ask the question. And I got a great answer from Luis here that's very valuable to me. And I'm getting great answers from other people that are different too, you know, like, sure. like, like, uh, in, um, and I didn't hold the, myself up as the end all be all right. uh, font of knowledge. Um, Maybe but, not end all be all, but you're an important voice in the community and you're an expert at this format. And you're a, an expert at the task of of curating this format. So I would be crazy not to uh, listen to you and uh, well, I do agree with that. <laughs> and, and wait and wait your opinions more than the average person. Not that sure. uh, everybody's person doesn't matter. But again, uh, like I'm really trying to listen to the content creators and the people who are on the front lines of presenting how to even play this to the world via Twitch and stuff, because those are the, if I, if I have the content creators on my side and enjoying the experience, it so much flows from that. Uh, good, good, good word of mouth. And I, I can tell you that that was the one change I absolutely hated. I, I just, again, think white pool adventures just, I, I really despise it. But overall, I think the changes you made, I, I would give you an A minus. I think they were awesome. And this is the most fun I've had playing vintage cube in a long time because of some of the changes like Dream Halls, like Helm of Awakening, uh, Gorio's Vengeance, like a lot of these like Can- goofy combo been cards. Cool. Oh yeah, Candelabra. Oh, Paradoxical Outcome. Like th- those are cards that, and, and this is more me. Like I think my comments on White Plume Adventures can represent a lot of people's viewpoints. Some of the stuff I specifically like, like I'm not saying Candelabra and Helm are like going to be fan favorites. They're, they're favorite. They're, they're things I like, but. Uh, Overall, I think you did an awesome job. So I, I really oh, appreciate it. Really great to hear. Thanks. It was it was pretty nerve wracking to uh, to go for that much change. And actually, I went in. I think I mentioned this in the article. My initial plan was take it easy, just a handful of <laughs> super safe changes, so that you don't rock this boat and scare everybody. And then I'm like, well, what do you? But what is this? You don't even like. Ha! Huh, how are you going to figure out this beast? If you go in taking it easy, like better to just like so. My 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 overall message to anybody who would not give me such a a, a kind grade, Luis, is <laughs> uh, bear with me. This was the shakeup round that we're gonna use to question everything and then settle it back down into more platonic ideal state, and then uh, get into a place where here what I want. Um, is a place where there is some stability understood about the cube that we that, that we're very transparent about the list. Like uh, one thing I knew was I just knew this was like as soon as I had the idea I'm like duh, like I should write a card comment for each of the changes, right? Turns out hugely positive change by the right? way. Right, like I mean. <laughs> Well, it turns out, uh, you know, set reviews are a popular thing. Turns out that uh, <laughs> Magic players like uh, like their like people talking about Magic cards, right? And it's a great way to explain myself and a great way for people to feel like uh, they, you know, at least frame things the way I want them framed. Uh, but also there was pretty loosey goosey. Like I, I came up with the idea late and I just cranked out. There's some ones that are maybe not the best uh, sentences I've ever wrote. But the point is I wanted to get it out there and show that I think this is correct. I think this is a great way to communicate what's going on. I want to do it not only for the changes, but I want to do it for every card in the cube. I want to be able to explain literally why every single card in the cube is in there. And if I can't, that then okay, that's a that's a, a good note. Um, and also to start writing up some notes on the most commonly requested cards that aren't in, or you know, and and get that on the discussion radar as well. Um, and so. The way I feel like 
magic is always traded in familiarity and newness at the same time, right? Every every new set is this all sorts of handholds that are familiar to you and that you recognize, but then all sorts of exciting new toys that are the reason you keep coming back to solve this puzzle, right? And I think Vintage Cube should be similar. And I think the way to, the, the where I want to get to with the Vintage Cube is, like I say, I'll, defining every card and defining almost, maybe even literally a tier list that I work on with the with the community. And because I think if you, you, you there's like, Here's how I describe the tiers of vintage cube inclusions. There's the ones that uh, define the idea of classic vintage cube, powered vintage cube, so power. The cards that if you didn't include, you can't really call it that anymore. It's like it, it, you can't call that an omelet if you didn't use eggs or an egg substitute. Like, right. like there, there's certain things you need to call it a thing. And if you're going to call it a powered cube, you need this stuff. And so... Uh, the power nine is obvious, but then there's things like soul ring that are also obvious. And then you, but like, where is that? It's, it's the borderlines of these tiers that get interesting. Like is library of Alexandria? What is it? Right. Can, could that be cut or is that essential? You know, like, uh, but that gets us into that tier two. Tier two is, um, these are basically expected in a classic powered vintage cube. And if you don't have them, you're going to get questions like you, you need to like what what is your what, what is your answer for why there's not a library of Alexandria in this cube there 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 are reasons but people are going to expect that kind of thing so uh, it's your answer for why you didn't have this in the cube level then uh, kind of the third stripe and that's more like the the really unique stuff that again the the stuff that they make fixed versions of and will never print that way again. Um, the, 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 the channels, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, the next layer down though is like not necessarily unique effects, but just the power pack, most efficient uh, goat at every slot in the curve for every color in, in the classic pie philosophy for that color. Like, you know, if you're making a classic cube, you need the most powerful counter spells, the most powerful burn spells, yeah. the most powerful uh, sweepers, mm -hmm. right? All, all, the, like name your classic uh, color pie mechanics. You got to have the most of those in the cube. Uh, gotta, gotta is strong because now you're into this area where you do have some flexibility because again, your, your mandate is to create a fun experience. If you just blindly put the most powerful things at every point in the curve for every color and mono red aggro becomes a 65% win rate deck over the field or something, you know, that, like that's a problem. Like right. people aren't, you know, that comes back to the whole experiential thing again. Um, but that's the level at where you start to be able to actually even get flexible uh, really on your decisions is that, that third tier down or the, uh, Unique strategies, but n maybe not super powerful. Maybe the maybe like this is where I would I would put um, show and tell, right? Like it, it, it's certainly something you can include in a vintage cube, and maybe some people maybe it's expected. Maybe it should be in that second tier, but I could certainly explain why I would put it in the third tier. You know? Yeah, that's um, a perfect borderline card because it it yeah. also it has just gotten a lot worse, right? Like. You know, is it? It's not even in the cube right now. That's right. I I pulled it. The, the, yeah, the, I, and I that seemed the, fine to me. Like it had really fallen out of favor. Eureka and Show and Tell are the pair of kind of like put big stuff on the battlefield trap cards that people talk yeah. a lot about and have a lot of opinions on whether they should or shouldn't be in the vintage cube. And I actually uh, for a while I was deciding in or out for kind of like both of them. And then I was like, no wait, like I really think that. First, there's more analogs for uh, Eureka and more effects like that in green. And um, we can do it in a way that uh, like Eureka is you can untrap yourself with a, a little more easily than you can uh, with uh, show and tell. So I decided to split those. But that gets to the, uh, the next thing I really want to do with the community and for this cube. And that is to like define some packages that are rotational. You know that that are understood oh. to be non-permanent. There's this uh, to go to the restaurant analogy again. You know, if you're crafting your your menu for a, a restaurant, 
you've got your mainstays that never leave your menu because the regulars have come to expect it and want it. But then you have your specials and your, your you know, your, your uh, your one timers, but then you have your stuff that you know is good, but you bring back sometimes, right? Yeah. And I want to have a more defined suite of that stuff for this cube and, yeah. and really get because uh, that's also where you like whether you, you know, White Plume Adventure, it, sure, sure, it has its fans, but name any other, uh, like I didn't bring in Whole Breacher. Should I have? Is Whole Breacher not fun, right? You know, there's a lot of not. Is this not is this too not fun to include to include yeah. in the cube despite its power level, right? Yeah. And what I would like to have is like, let's have a slot for that. Like that you get the <laughs> there's the one non-fun thing to do per cube because some people like it, but if you put too much of it in your cube, then it's not a fun cube. So like can you can can we start tagging some slots in the cube for specific things like that? That this is going to be a rotating powerful but annoying section so that every once in a while you know time vault does show up in the cube and it becomes a thing that you do for a a, a, a season but uh, that it goes away again that, that, that it's almost announced this is going to be a one-time thing goes away next one we never run this twice in a row it's right. a it's a flavor thing that shows up once every couple of years even but and, you want to uh, like earmark certain packages of cards combos certain cards that you feel like Look, we're going to move this this group out because it frees up a lot of room for something else that could be interesting or that we haven't done before. But don't fret. It won't be gone forever. Like, you'll still see right. it. Yeah. That yeah. makes a lot of sense because the arguments get weird around those, right? Like, Time Vault, most people were like, okay, this is stupid. But, you know, like, we still let Channel exist, right? Which is a very binary card. Like, you, you, you right. either play it Tinker. and win or it doesn't do anything. <laughs> like yeah. Tinker's interesting, you know, and like, I, I used to not like Tinker. I used to think it was one of those unfun cards, but now that it can get Bolas's Citadel, it's a lot more interesting. Like it's a different experience. It's probably just better well, than getting also, a stupid Seven uh, Eleven or whatever, but like, you know, I, I don't have access to the data that Ryan has, but I think Tinker and channel both probably don't have that high of win rates. Those are kind of hard to perform. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Channel especially like you, you really got to build around it in, uh, and if you don't have it in your opener, then you're tending to be ramping to that stuff more naturally and it can be really slow, you know? So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. And then when it does pop off, it's just stupid, right? You're just like, here's an Eldrazi on turn two or three or whatever. And they're just like, all right, game's over next game, you know? Right. And that's the key. I think that's the key. The unfunness of Tinker and Channel produces an, a, a game that's over in 30 seconds. Yeah. The unfunness of uh, White Plume it produces a game that's over in some number of minutes, unless you just want to scoop it up. Well, some you number know? of excruciating turns excruciating. where the boa constrictor I, I think, slowly yeah. suffocates you, yeah. A, a hopeless game that takes longer is, it, it, is, it does not, is not an upside. So. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> right, that's what, exactly, that's what yeah. I'm saying. So that, that's, why, that's why I think Tinker and Channel are more obvious inclusions and White Plume Adventure is a way more controversial, questionable choice that needs to be discussed. For, for what it's worth, too, I don't think it's just I, – I, like, I mean, you already know this, but power level is not like the only thing. And things like Monarch, like Palace Jailer, I think is – kind of comparable, right? They, they, they have a similar effect on the game in terms of if you can't hit me with creatures, you're going to be in a really bad spot. But Monarch is pretty simple to understand. You don't have to have played with Monarch. You don't have to learn to a dungeon <laughs> to, yeah. to get what's going on with the power. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. Um, Rye, we've got some questions from listeners. So why don't we, uh, why don't we hit, hit a few of these up? Sure. Um, this one comes from Rob who says, no, blah, blah, blah. Get on with it. Get on with it. <laughs> yes. Get on with it. Love Rob. <laughs> I I know what that means, but uh, you're you're kind for uh, bringing a, a inside joke onto your show. That's a, a former former viewer uh, hassling hassling me from beyond the grave of my uh, stream, basically. <laughs> yeah, and, and Rob does say I miss the stream, Ryan. It's great to have another chance to learn from you. I hope things are going great in your life and newish job. So thanks, Rob, for that. Um, Ian says, thanks, "What's Rob. your favorite card to put on the stack in Vintage Cube?" And also he wants to know what me and Luis uh, would answer for that too. Oh, that's a good question. I know mine right um, off the bat. <laughs> honestly, it's for me, it's probably Crater Hoof Behemoth. <laughs> Although I don't know if it goes on the stack so much as it's extracted from my <laughs> library and, and, and put yeah. onto the battlefield. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Tooth and Nail coming back was nice. I, I actually missed that card, uh, being in the cube. What about you, Luis? What's your 
Uh, I gotta say right now it's dream holes. <laughs> oh, very nice. It, it, it's it, that, that change has been the, my favorite of all of them. Just dream holes ha- has this quality. When you cast it, your opponent usually pauses to read it. Cause most people don't put this card in their deck or even in their mind, right? Like they just pe- bypass it in packs and then you get to cast a bunch of spells afterwards. It's not like it just wins the game. Like you get to, you get to have some play. You get to like cast your echo of the ends and kind of rub your hands together and hope. All right. Let, 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 let's get there. Yeah. It, m- mine is similar to yours in that way. It's a little different. It's high tide. Cause oh, once oh, I, yeah. once you get the train, you know, cause almost every time I cast high tide, I don't have the things needed to actually win the game at that moment. Right. But something good is going to happen. But something's <laughs> going to go down no matter what. And, uh, and, and I love the, the best types of cards in vintage cube. This is honestly, Luis, why I think your, your stream and your videos have been so great. It's rocket. <laughs> oh, rocket appearance. Ryan's got his dog. Oh, the rocket he was, man. Love it. He was waiting at the stairs, so I had to. Oh, he was demanding. I, fi- I figured you all wouldn't mind if I. No, that's I great. Know. That's just awesome. Turned, just turned 13. Oh, rocket. Old man what dog. A, what a good boy. Um, But yeah, the best types of cards, I, I guess, unless you're Ryan, who just wants to get it over with, but are the types for me that, that have that sweat, you know, where you're like, Okay, here we go. You know, it might be a draw seven or something like that where you're like starting to get the engine rolling uh, on that. Um, Atapong says, do you have plans to create new archetypes for the Vintage Cube? To me, it feels like it's just the same archetypes with some updated cards over the years. Um, honestly, probably not. I mean, here I am trying to find one or trying to support one in terms of like uh, uh, token sacrifice, and it's mm-hmm. it's probably not going to be good enough to stick around. I mean, I... I, I uh, I couldn't change, like, I could only do so much. Like, I changed a lot, and there was deadlines. You know, you can't just do, you can't just do work on this for five years. I had to finish. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so I kind of left. I had to roll with what was there and lean into it a little differently with uh, with, with some of the archetypes left behind. But the the real, ch- I, you know, the challenge of vintage cube design is that so much is, uh, written for you. Like there's just things that cascade into place, domino effect, decisions made for you, and then you're left with not a lot to work with. But I will, I'll work with you all on trying to find stuff to fi- to to fill the space that we do have with archetype affecting choices. Mm-hmm. But the trouble is, you you if you you head towards some new archetype in Vintage Cube, usually it's just not powerful enough to hang. No. And people get frustrated with it. Right. They don't want to do it. Yeah. I mean I to me it's more of a feature, you know, of a of the cube that you have similar archetypes. Because to me, there even if you're drafting within an archetype, unless it happens to be like mono white or mono red or something where they they actually do just have a lot of analog cards that are perform very similar functions as each other. You know, a lot of the decks don't, you know, if you watch Luis's uh, stream recently, he's been drafting a lot of storm, a lot of dream halls, that type of stuff. And yeah, you'll see some core cards. Like, you know, what archetype it is. They're, they're distinguishable from uh, another archetype, but like, they're very different builds, different wind conditions, different ways to go about it, whether you get the brain freeze or, you know, whether you have to use a storm card or whether you, uh, you know, try to like one card that I've really liked has been brain geyser. Like that I saw it. I thought, eh, it's probably too slow. I've brain geyser people out. Like that is a payoff. That is a real thing. You can use it to draw some cards yourself and continue down a path. You know, to me, there's enough wiggle room within the archetypes and there's enough number of archetypes that it never gets old. And that to me is the bar that needs to be hit. So I don't know. I mean, I like working in the fringes to like maybe push the art, you know, push an archetype here or there, but I don't know. You just don't have that much flexibility and the vintage cube already offers like, yes, I hear what Atipong saying when they're saying, look, you know, there's not, it's kind of the same archetypes. It's true, but it's the same, like 15 archetypes, like, you know, and one thing that you'll see is a progression, right? A lot of times when people first start playing cube draft, you know, they're drafting like some green white deck that you're just like, oh, that's, that's terrible. You know, and I remember when I started to level up just a little bit, the people who were ahead of me of that time were much more aware of the combos and of the weird cards, you know, like the dream halls. And like at that time for me, a card like upheaval was a card I hadn't played with or against. And I didn't really understand 
why it was, I thought, okay, it's like a big reset. And I didn't know that you could just like float a bunch of mana and sort of get yourself back on the board before your opponent did. And I had to experience that actually in paper locally <laughs> by getting trounced by upheaval a bunch of times and going, okay, I want to do that. And then I became the, okay, rampy blue, maybe some draw sevens upheaval guy, right? And it's like, okay, well, now you're kind of moving up the chain. Maybe you end up on the the blue green ramp deck and that ends up becoming your favorite thing. Like our friend Adam, you know, he loves that deck or whatever. And then you get to the end game and that's watch Luis's stream and you'll see what that looks like. Those, those look like unintelligible piles of cards to me, right? <laughs> I, I had someone uh, who tuned in. He's like, I've never played cube. Uh, I can't tell. Is your deck good, bad, unplayable? What is it doing? And it was just like, blue black storm deck that had like <laughs> you know it's just like as it turned out the deck actually wasn't that good but it's like it's so different than your normal experience of magic which is part of the beauty of cube it's like right you can log on and play white weenie mono red mono green if that's your speed you can play blue white control if that's what you want to do you can be a kind of mid-range black grindy discard planeswalker deck or you can and just these people can ignore the candelabras and paradoxical outcomes yes. and helms of awakening and they don't impact them at all or you can try to go for those things and just have a like a new dimension of magic open for you. Right. And and that's and that's you know to to add to Pong's question, I believe that there is that that it is in a good place with a number of archetypes and that and that having that comfort level where you don't have to relearn it from absolute scratch but there's still runway ahead of you kind of seemingly forever is a good thing. Uh, Nathan yeah, said, actually, I oh, really ahead, want man. it to be the uh, the the familiar cube. The, the, mm -hmm. it, it should be hard to break into. This is the you know this is a power driven cube. Uh, it's not the end all power. Obviously, we just discussed it's not the end all be all power. But I am trying, in general, to lean towards power unless it affects fun in the wrong direction. Yeah. Uh, and when you do that, you're just your hand is forced. Yeah. And there's, yeah. Uh, and so, so my response is just own it, embrace it. This is the, this is what it is. It's intended to be a classic experience. It's in, as long as I'm at the helm, unless I have some radical change in thought, it's intended to be a classic experience. And we go, and mostly we're going to go for flavor and spice and different archetypes in our alt cubes in between. Yeah. And that's the thing is that, you know, you, there is no shortage of people who have made, you know, cubes that have a specific sub theme or that lean into certain things. So those exist. It's just not what this one is. Uh, Nathan says, this is a question for all three of you. Have, have you ever thought of creating an LR specific cube? What cards would you add to it? Cards that came to my mind to be added are cards, the Elmers, the Shelleys, and the other new friends of the show. Oh, come on, Nathan. Like Felden Ronam Excavator. That's just, you know, <laughs> there's no reason to just sideline Yeah. Uh, no, I've never thought of that. I mean, that sounds like a funny exercise, but I I, I wouldn't want to like play it or own it. <laughs> yeah. The, the gimmick is, I think, funny at the top level, but it. Bear, doesn't bear out in practice. Like I played a mono green cube once and it was like funny to think about and funny to play once, but do you want to play it the fifth time? Not, not so much. Mm -hmm. Um, Ryan, you can answer this. As, uh, <laughs> I'm going to let you sort out these next two questions on your own. Right. Uh, and I'm not going to press oh, you boy. on them <laughs> to make sure you still have your job. Um, Robert says, hi, Ryan, as someone who's experienced working on both arena and magic online, uh, what single feature that MTGO has would you most like to see implemented on Arena? Um, well, that's interesting. It gets into the future planning stuff a little bit, but basically uh, the auto-tapping of mana to cast spells sensibly. Like I'm, I'm not saying um, uh, auto-passing priority or you know, any information leak, but... I think it's a real problem, and it's a real problem for acquiring new, more casual players when I'm playing a game of limited. I have four lands in play. I have one four-mana spell in my hand. I would like to move it onto the battlefield and have it cast. You know, like, <laughs> the, the fact that I have to click every land to cast a four-drop uh, is my biggest complaint about the uh, battlefield experience of, of magic online and the thing I want to address most and that arena arena does. Okay. I think arena does it well in the sense of uh, showing you if you let go, the highlighted stuff is what's going to be tapped, right? So yeah. it, it, it kind of gives you the preview that you can back off on. And I, I would like to have that uh, to, uh, so that you could, uh, 
cast a spell with one click and drag instead of uh, one click and then six more clicks when you tap right. your six lands. Um, Wood says, hey, guys, love having Ryan back on the show. Ryan, if you were given a magic wand, what is the one thing you would change about Watsy and how it handles magic? <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. Wow. And you cannot answer that if you, I mean, look, I, the reason I'm sensitive to this, right, is because Wizards of the Coast still has, you know, some influence or whatever over the company that Ryan works for that manages magic online. So, you know, it wouldn't be super smart for him to be like, oh, Watsy, they suck at this, they suck at that, you know, on the podcast. I, well, I can speak to, you know, uh, because I don't work for them, actually, it's like I can speak more openly as just a fan of the game and mm -hmm. as someone who is downstream from their decisions, experiencing the consequences of it. And the um, the rate of new card creation and the amount of text on the new cards in general is uh, exploding in the wrong direction for me. I feel like... Uh, even a lot like it feels like a lot of long time players are, are are feeling some exhaustion at even just trying to mentally keep up with what mm -hmm. is available mm -hmm. um there's enough kind of factionalization in terms of formats where it's like if you don't care about commander or eternal maybe you don't even look at the new commander cards or whatever, and that's fine. So there, there's a way we can kind of compartmentalize. But for people who like a lot of formats, or for people like me who had to like who had to care about every single card that gets made uh, in considering job stuff, it's a uh, I don't understand this pace. Other than uh, it feels like myopic short term gain and profit, uh, not killing the golden goose, but maybe whipping the, gold, the golden goose when you should be uh, caring Feeding for it a little and, more uh, yeah. uh, gently, you know? Yeah, I, it, that is definitely a common, I mean, I feel that way too. I think, uh, you know, that is the prevailing winds in the community is like easy there, right? Like we don't need 17 sets and, you know, and I mean, you know, they will hit a wall at some point, right? I, we, I had a long chat with uh, TBS about this on the podcast as well that, you know, there is a limit, right? The market will bear what the market can bear, but uh, you know, pushing that limit too far does have some uh, some downsides. And I, I don't mind as much like the explosion of alts and promos and bling. Like I don't think that I don't have any issue with saying <laughs> here someone with disposable income instead of this free basic land spend $50 on this great whatever. Like the the that's actually good when you can monetize like philosophically, I liked the uh, the box topper type idea, like buy a box and there's a cool card in it, because what that does is lower it puts the value of a box into this one high end, more bling bling hound level card and lowers the cost of magic. Uh, the rest of the set for people who just want the cards to play at their shop. So I don't I, I don't mind going skyrocketing the different versions of any individual card i think that's kind of cool and although i do i don't love serialization i think uh one of 10 or one of 100 is just kind of cop out collectability that's like i don't know it, it doesn't appeal to me as a collector because it's so transparently just like we're making this scarce yeah <laughs> <laughs> <You know? laughs> with like literal numbers on it and it's like that it feels uh shark jumpy in terms of collectability to me to do to to get into that level of uh of uh of scarcity um but i like monetizing your uh more well-to-do players with things that they really enjoy to help support the game being less expensive for other players matt says uh shout out to going optimal ryan had a great stream mm -hmm. going there he says but i'm happy to hear he's moved on to a new adventure um, how's it been not streaming? Great. Uh, the only thing I miss is the people. I really miss my audience a ton. The, like the, the, the interactions with other humans that are awesome people and made me smile. That's what I miss. But, uh, this, th there's a, as you both well know, like th there's a stress to getting pumped to be doing content and to uh, and, and putting yourself out every single day um, was pretty emotionally 
exhausting as it turned out. I kind of got into that mode with it where it was like I got used to it, I think. I, I adapted. But then once I stopped, like, I, di I didn't want that stress again like i i if it, it, which you know so yeah i miss i miss the people a ton i don't actually miss the stress of daily um present yourself to the world content creation it's tough it's a lot yeah it really is um i guess you already covered this one for for ron uh, about cards that you wanted to add but didn't quite make the list on cube i mean I, you, you put them in <laughs> right the, i'm assuming that the seven that you put in were you know on the close cut list there um, yes although th that gets to a point there's like uh the add cut thing can get a little bit individual card level where you know like really this was 80 cards out and 80 cards in right it's uh not always a one for one deal exactly and people can get hung up on uh the swap as opposed to this is really two decisions there's a decision to remove this one card and a decision to bring in this other one and those are two things that can be evaluated separately mm. uh, so uh yeah that that was something that i was thinking about a lot is i was taking in feedback is that um the, again, the discourse is around the cards that are there, not necessarily what uh, wasn't there. Uh, but I have a long, long list of potentials. And here's, here's the other thing with uh, vintage cube feedback. Let me tell you, everybody will share their list of ads. Nobody's telling me what they take out. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Just add it. Just add, 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 Ryan. Yes. It's like, mm -hmm, yeah, I'd like that card in too. And then I went to try to find the remove and every single one of them would have pissed you off. Yes. <laughs> yes. That, that is the challenge, right? I mean, that is really the, the thing that until you have it on your desk or until you're building your own cube, you don't really fully internalize. You just think I want this, you know, this reminds me of a thing that happens in sports all the time where a, tr a player will get traded from a team and they'll say, well, they can't win without that player. And it's like, well, who do they have in that person's stead? Like, it's usually somebody who's about 85% as good as that player was, you know, except for now they have money to spend elsewhere. You know, it, these things are usually not, uh, they're usually not quite the way that they seem until you're actually the one in the seat having to make the call on, yeah, on that kind of thing. One of the most important sports stats to come out of the new generation of sports statistics of the last couple of decades is war, you know, wins above replacement, which mm -hmm. really gets into that very thought. Like it's not about this person in a vacuum. It's about over what, right. And that, right. that's a, it's a, it's, it's true in and sports. It, with and true, cube, it's just the yeah. most perfect because <laughs> you literally have to take out something. If you put something in, uh, Jeremy says, congratulations on 700 episodes. Thank you, Jeremy. The, this podcast has uh, grown to be so much more than just a podcast, and a lot of that has to do with the foundation it was built on. This is a truly special community. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, Ryan and Marshall, when you guys started, what were some of the biggest challenges, and how did you overcome them? <laughs> it's funny. I, I I don't think, like, Ryan and I didn't have challenge. Like, I don't remember anything where we were like, we just don't know how to do this. Like, the, the, it was more just like it was a blank slate. Like there just wasn't, we just didn't know what would work. We didn't know, like there's no feedback. There was nothing there for us to, to mimic. So it was like just our intuition and just things that we thought we would like and things that we thought would help people learn or whatever, and just throwing stuff out, you know? And I mean, frankly, we just, we got lucky with a bunch of them, you know, the set reviews and crack packs and stuff like that were just things that we were like, this just kind of makes sense. Let's just try it. But you know, I don't remember you and I, Ryan, having like any major like obstacles. It was more just like, what do we want to paint this picture? You know? Yeah. I think, I think you're, I co-signed what you just said. There was not, it wasn't about, it wasn't about challenges because we were just doing a new thing we thought was fun and we had no expectations and right. it was more, the challenge was more just learning everything as we were going. And, but it was so easy for me. Like I went from, um, writing these articles that I would pour over for hours and it would probably take me 10 to 20 hours per article. Cause I'm just obsessive over words and, uh, you know, and then, uh, yeah. and, and then Marshall's like, let's do this podcast. And then suddenly my role was call Marshall, talk to, <laughs> talk to him for an hour or so, hang up. Yeah. 
that was pretty sweet. I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was, I loved it. Um, I, we've I mean, all found the co-hosts to be the most challenging part of the podcast. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, <that's true. laughs> Luis, uh, Jeremy has a question for you as well. He says, I'm one of the new generation listeners, so you're my first co-host. Thank you for everything you've brought to the show as well. My question for you is, how has it, how has it been going back to the pro tour? Is there anything that you'd like to see changed about it? It's honestly been awesome going back. Uh, it's been a really fun experience. Uh, Got to give credit to, to William Jensen and, and his whole team, uh, everyone involved, for making the Pro Tour come back. It feels like the Pro Tour. They hit all the marks. The only thing I would change, um, honestly, like I don't really have any 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 you know objections. Like I think that uh, I think that it's just been a lot of fun to get back in in the saddle and, and compete again. I guess I would have changed the deck I played at the last Pro Tour because <laughs> <laughs> I kind of spewed off a good start there. But uh, yeah, I, I think that uh, we'll learn more about how the system works in general. Like I. I tend to like to – I mean I know you're like this too, Marshall. I want to play in the system for like a year before I start talking about all the ways where it falls short. Uh, right. My fellow magicians are not you know, hesitant <laughs> to, to call out all the reasons that this <laughs> is bad or whatever when it's like, yeah. how, how about let's just play through this and let's, let's see how it goes. But uh, it's just been great. I have really look forward to it. Uh, this question comes from Daniel it says, has the sick guitar riff at the beginning of each episode always been the same? If so, who wrote it? How did you decide on it and why did you think it was – it's been so incredibly effective as an introduction to the show. No, it hasn't. In fact, when Ryan and I started, we used licensed actual music, um, but then the license ended. And so I couldn't use that anymore. And so we hired somebody. Now to we do use one. AI generated music. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. No, the one We're that we've all had... AI generated. This is pure AI right now. Yeah, <laughs> the one that well, we we have a big enough library of LR episodes. We fed we fed a you know Chat GPT six hundred ninety nine episodes of LR and, 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 and make number seven hundred. <laughs> yeah, of course um, it chose to bring me back. By the way, but yeah, of course it did. It, it is a very smart AI. Um, no, I, we hired uh, somebody to do that riff and they worked with us uh, pretty closely. Like we went through a few iterations of it to get the one that just sort of, I wanted something that, that sounded like it was kind of winding up or getting the engine going, you know, to start off the show, but I wanted it to be quite short. You know, I think that sometimes the intro stuff on content on YouTube and podcasts can be too long where you're like, okay, come on, let's, let's get to it. And I wanted something to just bring you in, but you know, get, get us into the business. Yeah, some people have asked you like, what's the whole song, right? And you're like, no, that's it. It's that is it. That is it. There was this, it actually is a shorter part of a longer riff that I picked out. And I said, Hey, it actually wasn't even the beginning. And I said, I like that part. And I, I want you to cut that out and, and, and work with that. And, but there was like quite a bit, there was drums and a whole bunch more. Um, Ryan says, um, everyone seems to love the bonus sheets for March of the machine limited uh, but has it interfered with going optimal? If I if I recall, saturating out the rares and mythics uh, to get gems for them in later drafts was part of the strategy. Do the extra cards in, in this set cramp your style? So this is uh, you know referencing that's, a, that's an arena Ryan's. question. Yeah. yeah. So uh, part of my my whole shtick of going optimal was, as the name implies, helping people figure out optimal strategies for maximizing their return on their arena time. And uh, maximizing gem return was a big part of that. And this uh, viewer listener is uh, asking about uh, what I did originally, which is uh, when uh, first, uh, you know, you could you could you could do this. You could go and when when drafts weren't human, when it was all bought and they could pause for whatever. I could see that there was a rare. I could go into my collection, craft it up to four copies, take the rare and get gems. You know, if I wanted, that was the idea. I actually my I abandoned that as my recommendation for optimizing arena for drafters. If you're an arena drafter looking uh, to, uh, to to optimize, then you need to um, uh, open multiple accounts. That's that's actually the key. You'll get way more out of uh, uh, playing till you win four times on Arena, switching accounts, and earning uh, in-game resources from a different account, and doing that until you're done playing for the day. Because mm. if you build up, if all you care about is limited, you don't care about your constructed collection anyway, uh, and you still build one for what that's worth. But then... Uh, Instead of worrying about uh, nickel and diming yourself over little gem decisions here and there, you're simply creating accounts that uh, 
ultimately kind of end up overflowing with gems. Like I have, I have no, I can play as much limited on arena as I want because when I'm finished with four wins on, on one, I switch to another account okay. because at, at four wins, the returns on playing, uh, fall off rapidly. Right. Okay. Hey, um, Luis, you got to go take care of the Sentinel. Oh, he's stomping around, and okay. uh, well, we'll, I, can't, I can't promise there won't be an eruption here at any minute. <laughs> okay, well, we'll let you, we'll let you jump off, um, and Ry I have a couple extra questions for Ryan, and then sure. Ryan and I, I will wrap up. I do have one quick update. Uh, BK wanted uh, the show to know that he's actually first on the trophy board now, so oh, that's he, cool. he, he, he you, was getting to work during the show. You slandered so. <laughs> his good name. Yeah, I don't, wow. don't want to misrepresent his position there. Okay. Uh, Ryan, it was a pleasure having you on the show. Um I, like I said, I'm really excited to have the cube in your hands. You, you get it. And I'm, I'm excited to see what, what, like, I like all the changes you made. I like your idea of rotating packages in and out. And, uh, I had one, one final short question. How often can we expect to see the vintage cube on magic online? Is there like a set schedule or idea for that? The, that is another thing that's somewhat in flux. Uh, currently, the idea is four times a year, you know, kind of quarterly, uh, but it could increase. Like we, we, Vintage Cube and Cube started on Wizard side as a tail filler. You know, as a new set comes out and the 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 tail of the profit starts to fade, you know, it starts to get small, we're like what can we put at the end of a set that gives us a new excitement. And so that's was its role for uh Magic Online Wizard side, but on Daybreak side it's more the flagship offering of the whole product i mean it's like it's vintage cube it's commander it is uh eternal formats non-rotating formats those are the things that are our competitive advantage over other offerings like arena and, and even paper to an extent um but uh so leaning into that uh is going to be key and um so it's quite possible we'll explore more vintage cube um there, there there's that whole it's the McRib, it's the ice cream that you don't get all the time philosophy that it has operated under for a while. But I was even talking to Daybreak leadership uh, a couple weeks ago about specifically questioning that dogma, you know, like saying, like, why are, why are we assuming that's right? Like, yeah. let's, re let's figure out what's right for Magic Online. Yeah, I, I think that it would only be responsible financially and, uh, you know, <laughs> as leadership to, to really have to run the experiment of what did happen if we always had Vintage Q. Well, you know, I think with a, like a year long trial, you'd really find some good data. Is, is all I'm saying. <laughs> that seems like an unbiased response. I'll take yeah, totally. That. Most yeah. definitely. Just just look uh, out for that thanks, bottom thanks, line. Thanks, I really appreciate. <laughs> all right, appreciate I will catch you guys later. I, I'm glad I got a good grade from you. That means yeah, a lot. No, you certainly did. And, and, and you can ask Marshall. Time. I'm not shy about saying nope. the opposite if I if that's nope. what I feel like. He this, means it. Vintage cubes near and dear to my heart. I wouldn't uh, blow smoke about that one. So, uh, I look forward to, to I look forward to seeing more. Okay, Luis. We'll see you later. Um, a couple more questions, Ry. Uh, one of them from listener Tyler, who this is, um, says it relates to Ryan. This question only relates to Ryan and it's only that he shares the last name with the country that's hosting the next magic con. <laughs> he says, but do either of you have any experience playing in or doing coverage in a foreign country where the majority of players might not be using cards in a language that you can read? And how do you navigate those games? If you can neither read the cards nor memorize every card that you play against, are there special concessions made in matches like that? And I'll tell you, I have done that, though it's only actually happened once. Um, if you even go to a Pro Tour, um, the cards are almost all in English, and even if it's hosted, like in this case in Barcelona and Spain, um, uh, you know, in a couple of months' time here. Um, they do seem to be the, the standard. You can use whatever language you want. The one time that it has happened to me that the majority or all the cards weren't was in Japan. And we did a GP in Japan that was preceding a G uh, pro tour. So they flew us out early and we covered the GP and it was a limited GP. And so they distributed the product with Japanese product. And it was really interesting because I knew all the cards, so I didn't, I wasn't worried about it, but it was really interesting how the, the way that BDM described it to me, because I told him, I'm like, man, I'm actually having a hard time with the card names, even though on camera, you can't read the card name. You, you know, you just know it's, it's, you know, you see the artwork and, and you know what it is, or at least that's what I thought. The way he described it was, it's more like a, a hieroglyph, a magic card. It's not just the picture, 
but it's also like how many words are above it, you know, the casting cost, the color, all these other things that your brain recognizes and memorizes that aren't just the straight up name or the artwork of it. And I remember I was like, wow, this is a lot harder because the number of characters and the shape of the characters was different, you know, on the title of the card, you know, than what I was used to from the English one. So as a coverage person, it is actually quite difficult um, if that happens, but that's the only time that's ever happened. Every other one, if if they're using non-English cards, it's like the exception rather than the rule. Um, and then of course, to your question about special concessions, uh, anytime you're playing in a sanctioned event, you can ask the judge on hand for an Oracle reading or an Oracle text reading. I mean, which means that they will read you the current up to date rules text off of the card and you can do that anytime you want. So there's your, that there's a special concession. If you're uh, playing um, with, with cards that you don't know what they do, just raise your hand, call the judge and say, I'd like an Oracle text on this card and they will bring it up on their phone. Usually is how they do it these days. And then they'll, they'll read it to you. Ryan, the thing I wanted to finish off with was you mentioned um, feedback, community feedback and how you've been using it. You know, you got some good feedback from Luis here. Um, and I know that you've been getting it, you know, uh, from all different places. The, the two things I wanted to talk about were one is where or how are you receiving the feedback and, and, and where would you like to receive it rather than just random Twitter stuff or, you know, I don't know, emails or things that are harder to track. Where are you gathering or where's the best place for people to give it to you? And then the other one is um, more just personal to you. You're a human being and you're getting all this feedback and it's like, it's all to you. You made these changes. Why did you do this? Why is this not here? Why did this get taken out? Right. And I know even as somebody who's been doing content in this space for a long time, it is still, and I believe will always be difficult for me to parse feedback. I, my brain still has that stupid thing where 99 people say your thing's awesome and I love it and thank you. And then the one person goes, you never talked about this on the show. And I'm like, Ugh, you know, and I, that's the thing I'm thinking mm -hmm. about. And it can lead to like becoming jaded or to becoming like, oh, the community doesn't know some guy is saying this, you know, but even though 12 people said, no, no, that person's wrong. And, and you don't know who that person is. You know, they have no credibility in this space. Like there's no, you have no rapport with them at all. Right. And it's somebody just spouting off on Twitter. And that's the thing that will stick in your brain, or at least in mine as a fallible human being. How are you managing that too? I, I wonder. Well, first I, I, I gotta say, I'm impressed with the magic community. I was really bracing myself because I knew I couldn't possibly do this mistake free. I, mm -hmm. I knew that I had some winners, but I knew there were going to be some losers I was going to hear about. And I was, and it, and it, it's hard to uh, get dragged on the internet, you know, like to put yours. That's why I think initially I was leaning towards something much safer and easier. That it yeah. would, it was frankly easier to just, uh, yeah, I didn't change much. It is what it is, right? Um, mm -hmm. But I knew I was like. You're going to have to just accept that uh, some people are going to express their feedback um, less tactfully than others, and uh, you got to put it out there to get the info. That's the main thing, right? Mm -hmm. So stealing myself up with that mentality, first, was the first part. Second thing was that the community ended up being uh, really uh, maybe I've just missed where the jerks are, but like all the stuff that I've been consuming, whether it's a content creator doing a, a stream where they're talking about it, a Twitter thread where somebody's reviewing it, like the feedback has been so reasonable. Even when it's like emotional, it's been like funny, emotional, not mean at me, emotional, just mm -hmm. like what, how, you know, like I love that, like, but that never feels like you're an idiot. Right. I, I know, I don't feel like anybody has screamed at me, you idiot. And again, <laughs> please don't link me to that. I don't need to see it. But the point is, uh, mm -hmm. By and large, uh, everybody has been very measured and reasonable in their response. I think they, for most people who care enough to respond, they probably read my article, which at least gave them a philosophical framework and maybe helped uh, uh, cushion that a little bit. But really it's, um, and, and parsing, you talk about like, how do I uh, know what feedback matters? Again, I mean, I even said like, I'm, I'm waiting the feedback of, uh, vintage cube aficionados and um, content creators more so than, and also arguments matter. Like um, I heard there, the, the one one negative uh, re review of the um, changes I saw was just this. <clears throat> um, Lol, 
uh, show and tell cut. That's all I need to know that this is a trash update. Uh huh. Right. And it's like, that doesn't bother me at all. Cause there's right. nothing, there's, there's nothing there. There was right. no exchange of ideas there. And really anybody who has taken the time to give an idea to me has been doing so um, tactfully and with, with, you know, with kindness and an awareness that this is not an easy thing to do and that things are going to change. Like um, even, even the most painful changes to somebody were mostly expressed by saying, I hope that, card returns soon yeah right? that you know yeah. that's the level so thank you to everybody who has provided discourse so tactfully it really in in today's world it's tough to be a game designer putting yourself out there it put, put tough to be an anything designer and putting it out there on the internet for feedback you know yeah uh, and i'm really impressed with uh, the way that the community has come through for me on on this one uh, with their tact and, and approach to things and yeah. uh, in terms of how to reach me on that front the 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 primary place i'm uh, scouting and reading from players is in uh, the uh, magic online discord and uh, i gave marshall a link to that so i'm sure it'll be in the notes and available to you all but uh, there's a cube section in the Discord, and I even have a there's a cube uh, there's a sub thread that's like Ryan's cube thread. If you want to give feedback directly to me, I'm checking in on that one, and that's going to be the uh, the best way to interact with me on it, and is going to be where I build any future uh, deliberate ways to interact. I want to get more formal about uh, player involvement, uh, in the same way that uh, we've said. Cubes are actually really resilient. They can withstand um, some some weaker cards uh, without it disrupting the whole thing. You can you can take some shots here and there, and so my where my head goes with that is so then why am I not giving the players that shot? Like why why am I not talking to players and saying you decide? We're going to vote on this. Mm -hmm. We've got five slots in the cube, and they're going to be hundred percent player decided, and that that's fine. Like why not? Right and. Um, so I really want to expand the way in which we're using Discord to uh, solicit, gather, and implement feedback on the Vintage Cube. And I want to get y'all involved. I want to be transparent. I want, instead of a surprise on, you know, here's what the Cube is. The update article is live. Here it is. I hope to be working with you all weeks in advance of the next Vintage Cube saying, here's where I'm at now. Uh, what are your thoughts? You know, like there's no reason not to be uh, transparent with this. It's our most important offering on Magic Online. And why not uh, be deeply involved with the most passionate players of it and and get it right? Yeah. And I, I like that. I You know, my advice to you when it, when it comes to taking feedback, you know, would be to pay very close attention to who it's coming from. I, you know, one thing that I had to learn about social media, about communities on social media is that I, I kind of viewed it as like, um, one of the big features of it was that anybody could show up and chime in, right? Like if we're on Twitter and let's say you and I, uh, start going back and forth about cube changes, I think you should do this. Well, we're looking at this. We're talking about, well, other people can chime in and say, this is what I think. And I thought, oh, that's, that's awesome, right? That, that, that's kind of the, the promise of, of social media is that it opens the discussion to more people and to, to everybody potentially. But what I've learned after having actually used social media for a number of years, right, is that it becomes way, way, way too easy to pay attention to people who make comments like the one you said, right? If, if they just literally call you names, it's very easy to ignore or block or whatever. But if they, this person's in that in-between stage, right, where they're mocking the change, they're not adding anything to the conversation, um, Yet at the same time, they're not just being like a pure troll that's just like you suck or whatever, right? Right, and I and there is information to take there, like that uh, that the loss of show and tell was was painful for this player. Mm -hmm. They this was a fan of that card who thinks that it should still be in the queue, right? And that's and, that's a vote to know, right? And I'm, that's I, fine, I, you know? and, and that's fine, right? But if you're going to actually listen to what people say. I want to know who that person is. You know, every time one of my friends in the magic community says, oh, did you see this person on Twitter said this? Can you believe that? And I said, who is it? Like, is it somebody that we actually know who participates in this community, 
who has their actual name or something that they're known for. It might not be their, their actual, actual name, but you know, that they're known for, they are the same person who's in Twitch chat, who's also on Twitter, who also sent you an email once or whatever, where you're like, this person actually earned a voice. Like they get to say something that I'm actually going to listen to because I know they have a track record versus yeah. somebody who's like brand new and maybe they have something good to add, but they haven't earned it. Right. And like, that's not how social circles work, right? If you, if you go to any, you know, go, go to a long running poker game with the same people in it, and then go yourself as the new person, insert yourself into every conversation and start dropping opinions and disagreeing with people <laughs> and see how that goes for you. Right. They're yeah. going to be like, who the hell are you? Right. Like you don't know what, what we talk about here. You don't, you know, that type of thing. And and so, you know, for me, if, if I were in your shoes, I would be really interested, like you said, and, and I like that you've said this a couple of times that you're focusing on the content creators, you know, the people who are really front and center with Vintage Cube who are in the trenches playing it. You can see that they're doing it. They obviously care about it. You know, those are the opinions I'd be really interested in. Luis is kind of the unicorn of that because he also has the game design background. So you kind of get, you know, both like, it's not exactly. just like a, you know, like whenever I give you my opinion on something like a vintage cube, I'm always like thinking there's probably something I don't know. Right. Like th I don't have the complete picture. So I'm kind of like, I feel this way, but you know, like if you, I easily could see you saying, but what about this? And me being like, right. Okay. That makes sense. You know, you can't pull this card because it ruins this other archetype or it's a linchpin for this other thing. Or if you add that, it makes the 19th red burn spell and, and that's just too many or, you know, whatever. Cause you know, it's easy to fire off opinions. It's hard to be the one who actually has to uh, enact. Oh yeah. <clears throat> yeah. At any but rate, the, and mm -hmm. that's already even like the, the discord has been great. And, and because like it self starts to self select, you can't, yeah. you, if you want to engage there, you and, and talk to me about it. Great type, you know, people are apologizing for their novels and I'm like, no, right. Give me your novels. Like, cause mm -hmm. that's what shows me that, you're thinking about this and that you're not just some rando uh, with a thoughtless opinion. That's just emotional, right? Like right. I, I don't like, sh I want show and tell like there's it's just emotional yeah. as opposed to here's why here's what show and tell does for my enjoyment that matters. And I think, you know, like there's just, just there's so many different ways to approach discourse and uh, I'm just really happy with how people are doing it on, uh, on discord right now it's uh, okay uh, and then you said that you have the article this is the one that outlined the changes itself yes okay and i'm I'll actually put a link update. to that too yeah and by uh and check for it uh so when we it's not going to be updated before next week but monday or tuesday we'll update that article to have the table reflect the changes i talked about on this show and to uh update you know fix uh, address fix some comments, some, some comment changes, and maybe some more. I'll see if I can get to it this weekend, but I don't okay. know. Yeah. Okay. Um, where can people find you? Um, you know, if they want to, uh, again, I'll put the discord link in for the cube stuff, but what about for you? I think really at this point for, uh, th that's it. Like I, I've, I'm not really on Twitter much anymore. I'm not it either. has not become a place I want to be. Same. And, um, so, Discord is not the place I want to be either. My my uh, going optimal fans know how I feel about uh, the user experience of Discord, and it is not a positive review. However, uh, it is has very useful tools for the kind of communication and feedback and community building that uh, Magic Online needs. So, <laughs> despite my feelings about Discord, I am being more active on it, uh, especially in the Magic Online realm uh, for for this kind of thing. Yeah, you can. Uh, at me there and, um, I will see it within a week, you know? Uh, yeah, it's part of your <clears throat> workflow. Okay, cool. Yeah. <clears throat> well, that's great. Ryan, thanks so much for coming back on the show, man. It's always so great to have you on. It's just, it's like we pick up right where we left off. <laughs> Talking about magic with Marshall can do. Thanks yeah. for having me. It's always great to, to come back and, uh, marvel at the longevity of this thing we built. It's really cool. Just, I can't believe it's still going. If you want to find us on social media, <laughs> even though, as I said, I often don't use it. I'm Marshall underscore LR and Luis's LSV. You can find everything related to the podcast, including all of the episodes, the ones, all the ones that Ryan and I did, that I did with John, that I did with Brian, and all the long run with Luis that we've had here as well at lrcast.com, as well as links on the front page of that to like Luis's stream. I mentioned that a bunch of times today because he's been, uh, 
streaming the Vintage Cube. It's been really fun to, to watch. If you want to link up to that, you can find that right on the front pages and, and as well as the Patreon and everything else that we do here on LR. Again, I want to thank everybody that supports us on Patreon. It really does mean the world to us. Thank you so much for that. And with that, we'll see you next week. Uh, <clears throat> oh. I have something. Oh, you, th- okay. you didn't think I had it. No, a, a, I didn't. A, a I actually totally off. forgot. I, I was like, oh I no. I come with sign offs. Um, I wa- it's 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 related to the major topic here. The work on Vintage Cube that I was doing caused my brain to think about different tweaks to the format itself, like how you know, not just card level, but mm-hmm. like functionally how cube works uh, on magic online that uh, got my got my gears going and juices flowing i thought i would throw some out at you to 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 see which of these are ones that you would be interested in as players versus no don't do that ryan okay. um the first is like noting it kind of started from looking at uh caleb's cube he did a vintage cube for magic online that uh issued the singleton uh rule Mm. And it had uh, like three copies of every fetch and, um, you know, uh, two copies of every dual and that kind of thing to uh, to increase the availability of that quality of card. That could be a solution to help with things like, oh, it's it's tough to support card like like uh, I wish there was another fast bond. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but. I could, I could put two fast bonds in. Should mm-hmm. we just, should we just double up on cards that are unique and powerful that we want to support? So they show up more often, or is that too sacrilegious for vintage cubes? So that's, that's one thing to think about. Okay. Yeah. I like um, that. That's interesting. Another one is uh, part of what we're going to need to do longer term for magic online is create our own pipeline for card creation, which could get us to a point where we can make our own magic cards that are, are unique. Uh, and so like this got me th- one thing that maybe like one of my mistakes that I didn't correct this time, but I will correct next time is, um, is the dual land situation. I'm not happy with the pain lands I put in, but I'm yeah, also not Luis happy doesn't with, like them either. I'm not happy with tap lands. I like that. I know that was a mistake, but I don't know what the right thing to do about it is yet. Uh, but we will, you know, we can, we'll figure that out. Um, but uh, the it could be one of the things that got me annoyed is that that, that there's that cycle of the um, horizon canopy cycle that's mm-hmm. only six cards deep right now, like mm-hmm. there's that, mm-hmm. which is where that whole thing came from. There's four there's four creature lands and six uh, horizon canopy lands in the cube. There's no reason like we couldn't on daybreak side make four. Uh, make the four replacement horizon, make the four missing horizon canopy lands and put them in the cube before they oh. even exist in paper, right? Oh, interesting. Uh, right. So we could make cards that don't exist t- to support the cube. And that's the card that got me thinking about that. Like completing that cycle got me thinking about that. But then I got thinking about like how, you know, instead of just doubling up on fast bonds, what if we made a new fast bond, a two mana fast bond with some other rider on it that, is vintage power like it's fast bond level power but the only place it ever appears is vintage cube it's not mm-hmm. even vintage legal it's not part of the vintage metagame mm-hmm. it is only part of the magic online vintage cube experience where we create specific cards to fill roles or, or fill holes that make certain archetypes tough to support or certain single card strategies tough to support do you what about that uh i'm not thinking in terms of um of online digital only mechanics because i know people like to make physical copies of the cube so i would want all the cards to be cards people could play in paper but there's no reason we couldn't make some new perfect green phyrexian mana artifact eight drop that was something you could both channel uh green tutor yes. uh, artifact power you know like choose all your things it right? just like, hit all these cross sections right yeah. and we could we could totally do that um and not wait for wizards to make it for us. We could do it ourselves. What do you think of that? Um, then we get to my two f- actual favorite ideas that I want to really think about doing. Um, <clears throat> the first one uh, is the notion of a um, Canadian Highlander cube draft. Mm. So imagine a vintage cube draft except take your vintage cube and pull out every single card that costs points in Canadian Highlander. And then draft as normal 
and at the end of the game, add to your pool a point legal set of uh, the point cards from mm. Canadian Island. So, Interesting. So if you are frustrated that you never get to play with Black Lotus, well, in this format, you can literally play with it 100% of the time. If you, if it's you just going to cost you a bunch of points. That's it really just cool. Your point. And then you can decide after the fact what set of uber powerful OG magic cards best supports the the deck draft, you did. Oh, deck. that's interesting. Yeah. So I and you, like you could that. pick. I, I like the thing I like about that is being able to pick which color mocks. Because, mm -hmm. you know, how many times you just have to take the mocks and it's like you're just running some Off white color. mocks in your blue black deck. It's like, ah, eh, you know. And because that solves the problem, like people want to do Vintage Cube because they like the fun of playing, of opening and playing with power. And so mm -hmm. this would be a format that's like, oh, it guarantees that not only do you get the power, you get the power you want, but it's not busted. Everybody has, it's yeah. a level playing field, yeah. right? Yeah. So that's an, I, that's a notion I like, and it wouldn't work well as well in paper, because what if we each want a Black Lotus? <laughs> yeah, right? you need a lot but of Black Lotus. it works Lotus. perfectly on Magic Online, because we can do that. Uh, yeah. We can all have. We can it all works have well it. if you own eight power sets of power nine yeah just buy eight power and then you got it all covered, <laughs> take it with you to the store yeah and then my final idea and this is the one that at the very least i want to get transparent with people about vintage cube collation how the packs are made and how we can start looking at it as a potentially flexible tool to change the experiment uh, experience oh. but i don't know if it's something you all want or not so uh, let me let me get into this so cube the number of cards you have in a cube is generally a variance knob. Uh, people do 360 card vintage cubes because they want all the power to show up every draft, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's what people are there for. So let's just have 360 and we know that it'll all be there. The trouble is that's a low variance experience in terms of the different card, you know, if you, there's no mystery, you know every card's gonna be in all the packs and it's uh, the this, it gets too stale too quickly. Yeah. Uh, so we've landed on 540. We've in the past even tried like a 720, uh, not on a vintage cube, but on like a, on a modern cube or whatever. But 540 tends to be this place. Well, well, you see two thirds of the card every time. So name a card in the cube, two thirds chance it ends up in the draft, right? And that mm -hmm. has landed at a good place uh, in terms of variety, but you still see the power often, right? Mm -hmm. All right, so keep that in mind. Now I'm gonna tell you about how we build packs. The way that you build a, uh, a Magic Online uh, cube draft is uh, the designer creates 15 deck files that are 36 cards each. Okay. So, and then uh, a cube booster has 15 slots in it. And to populate your 24 boosters for your eight person cube draft, you start a, you take uh, a random card from each of the decks and put it into the booster. So, so uh, 15 slots, 15 random pulls from your, your deck tables effectively mm -hmm. is, is how that works. And that's, but the thing is, it's just been kind of accepted dogma that uh, you make all these even and that like the, basically the way it works is like deck one and two are, white cards deck three and four are blue cards five and six right and then oh okay uh you know decks uh 10 is uh, 11 are colorless and then you get into gold and land and then mixed right so it, it's the way that allows you to have some collation yeah so that you never get the pack that's literally 100 percent red cards because right. of chance like right. that can't happen because there are simply uh some slots that don't have any red cards possible right mm -hmm. So that's how we construct these packs and give it, and that's an interesting thing too, like the Moxin are in the deck files that are associated with the color. So Mox oh. Emerald is in the green. Oh. And then like the, the other power nine are all in one kind of power, uh, or maybe that's not even true, I think the blue power is in with blue. But what that means is that there can be a pack that has three Moxin, a Black Lotus, and a Time Walk, uh -huh. right? Mm -hmm. Is that desirable or not? Would you rather right. have all that stuff insured to be spread around? And that gets to what I'm going to bring. This is the idea I really want your thoughts on. Kind of, want, I wish Luis was still here for this too. There is no need. We don't have to make each of these 15 deck files exactly 36 cards. Oh. If we made 
deck number one, 24 cards, then in every vintage cube draft, uh, those 24 cards would be in every single one. Oh, right? oh really? Right? Because. Wow. Uh, so if you wanted to take the power, the, 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 the best 24 cards in, in the cube and put them in deck number one, you, we could guarantee that every draft had those cards so that all power nine would be in every single draft. Um, on the flip side, we could take deck number 15 and make that the replacement level deck. This is the these this is the cards that we understand are not essential to the cube. These are are the ones we go to change, and this is the the one that we rotate through. And in fact, this has seventy two cards in it because you know what, um, it doesn't really matter which aggro red drop creature you get. This one has three of them, or you know, like the point is. Um, you, you could make we could make a variety section. So we, we have the we have the deck slot that's like this is specifically not variety. We want a hundred percent of these to show up every time. But then in this one over here, we're gonna actually three exit. So like 24 times three, so that it really oh, these only show up a third of the time. O only one in every three drafts will these cards even show up. Mm -hmm. And that can be a way to inject variety into your cube experience without diluting the frequency frequency with which the power cards that people are attracted to in the first place uh, are available. So that's really interesting. And you could in there's middle ground too. Uh, like let's say we have the uh, like that second layer we talked about uh, tier listing uh, cube cards, right? Uh -huh. And uh, take that second layer of uh, or even the third layer. Let's call it the third layer. Like that 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 show and tell layer. Um, you could have that be a a, a wide a, a long a bigger one so that it was more variety and then another one where like let's say uh, what's one that you really like and think should mostly be in the cube but you could understand if it got cut sometimes like let's say click channel right yeah. like as yeah. you said channel is tough to build around it's iconic it ought to be in most of the time but you could justify cutting it maybe here and there right yeah so you could put channel in the one that instead of 24 or 36 was just 28, 30, right? So that 80% of the time it showed up in the drafts instead of 100. Anyway, the point is you can, um, instead of just marrying 36 cards per deck file, 24 of which make it into the draft, we could shift things around to uh, increase, to, to basically get the benefit of the 360 card cube and the benefit of the 540 card cube in the same cube. That's and cool. Be because of digital powers. Right. Uh, and what I would want to do in that case is try and keep the cube still at 540 cards so that people could build it in paper and still have a cohesive real uh, paper experience, but it would just be weighted in the digital experience to deliver more of what people wanted in terms of both power and variety. I love that. I, I really like that you can still keep that because, you know, I know it's not the number one priority. It's probably pretty far down the list. But if this is the template from which people build their in-person vintage cubes, if that type of collation tweaking would make it so that you wouldn't build the cube the same way without it, then that could be a hit, but it sounds like you could just have both. You just you just get both, right? That's, That's really that cool. was my thought. And then yeah, and you can uh, uh, it, it's just an interesting approach to getting that to get getting what we're looking for Man, out of the experience. Because you could just constantly tweak those, right? Right, and in fact, it, it makes the curation job easier as well. If you're, if you, because right now I'm looking at 15 deck files and 540 cards, and trying to wrap my head around it all. Uh, what if Marshall, I said to you, "Hey, Marsh, you're you're a, a content creator and a notable in the community. We're gonna have you be the uh, guest curator for this instance of the Vintage Cube, but you just change deck file number 15. Mm -hmm. Like this is what you play with. Everything else is set, but you get to choose the the flavor of the of the Man, iteration. That's so cool. That's so cool because it really does let you silo off things that you know are core." to the vintage cube experience and that you either mark as completely untouchable or you need a really good reason, you know, to mess with this where you can, 
You can put the cards that are borderline, that aren't performing well, that are maybe overstayed their welcome a little bit or didn't quite work out. And those can become the ones that you you swap around and, you know, maintain that exactly. same thing. That's really cool. I like so, that. So, yeah, I'm trying to get more of a skeleton defined for the cube that operates that way. And as I was building out the skeleton, I started it with the with 15 deck files, 36 cards mentality. And I was like, wait, I don't actually, we don't need to do that. Like there's real flexibility here to uh, nuance that uh, hmm. frequency of seeing any given card. Yeah. Oh, that's really cool. So uh, let me know what you think of that gang. It's a little uh, <laughs> extended sign off classic Ryan, but there you go. <laughs> Looking for your feedback on discord and I will see you all there. 